Ma'am, please wait. Uh, we'll uh, invite you. In the meantime, I'm managing the Facebook Live. Okay. Now, may I request the Professor Rana sir to kindly uh, welcome our speaker of today's session. Okay, thank you very much and good afternoon. Good so, afternoon, Professor Rana ji. Namaskar, So now welcome Professor Mitanjali Rao, who is Professor in the School of Architecture. Campus KLE Technological University, Hubli, and uh, her researches focus on sustainable and resilient transformation of heritage towns, documentation, and imposed vision plans for cultural landscape in Karnataka. She's involved in projects like UNESCO nomination dossier and management framework for Badami and Iola. And at a personal level, I can say she's my adopted sister. And uh, we have very close connection from Hampi to Ayodhya to Gorakhpur. So this way, she has been co-sharing our experiences. Thank you, Professor Yanaji. Uh, it's it's my honor to present. Uh, my experience and my journey with the, the experts from across the world. And uh, yes, I'm sharing my screen. Uh, give me a moment, please. It's visible, ma'am. Is the screen visible now? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. And uh, this is uh, a case study from Karnataka, Uttara Kannada, uh, and one of the most important pilgrim sites of Jains, uh, Mudabitri. And this is close to other cultural sites in Karnataka. Uh, though I'm not looking at all the other 17 sites in and around Karnataka, but I would like to, to focus on Mudabitri because this is my long-term uh, research. So I have started with a couple of sites of Jain's uh, pilgrimage sites in Karnataka, but Mudabitri is one of the sites in Uttara Kannada. The structure of the presentation uh, runs through uh, with introduction and uh, establishing the cultural significance of the place and what role the culture plays in SDG and why is it that I have adopted an HUL approach to understanding the place better uh, and followed by recommendations and strategies? Uh, Mudabitri is a pilgrimage town in Dakshin Kannada, and uh, it is also called as a Jain Akashi. Uh, there are almost 18 bastis, which is nothing but temples of uh, Jain community, 
situated along the river Falguni. And it is not just the pilgrimage site and, uh, and uh, not because of temples at the play, the, it attracts the, uh, the Jain communities, but it is because of the ancient uh, the manuscripts, which is called as Dhavalas, which is uh, found and kept there in one of the bastis in its original form on the palm leaves. Mudibadri is the a very fast growing town and uh, even though it, it is a pilgrimage site, it has, uh, it is, um, the, the, the pace at which the organization is happening is uh, very fast and which is taking a toll on the natural setting of the place. There are many industries uh, which are food-based industry, but what is most important is that it is also known as one of the educational hub where you find uh, some of the finest institutions, be it engineering and medical colleges. The legacy of uh, uh, the legacy of uh, Jainism in Karnataka uh, dates back to 297 BC uh, when Chandragupta Maurya, who was the founder of the Maurya dynasty, uh, he abdicated his throne and was uh, traveling and he came all the way to Shravana Belgola, which is close to Murtitri, and he became a Jain ascetic and he breathed his last in this Jain center, which is today revered as a Chandragiri or Shravana Belgola. Jainism in Karnataka flourished under various kings uh, of the Ganga, uh, starting from Gangas to Chalukyas to the Rashtrakutas. It is later it became a seat of uh, the Chauta king, who is a Jain uh, king, uh, in the years in the, in the 17th century. And today, the families of the, the Chauta, uh, the royal family, still reside in one of the palaces across the river. This is uh, the, 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 the river Falguni today is a dried up river and there's a lot of encroachment uh, onto the riverbed. The clusters of red, what you find at the pin junction of the river are nothing but 18 Basadis, which is prominent, uh, which is interconnected by means of different ceremonial routes. Onto the bottom side of your river, what you see is the, the, the urbanization, the direction of the growth you can see the area within the, uh, in and around the temple complexes are predominantly Jain communities who are residing there. The other shrines of Hindu shrines, you can see them spread across in orange, especially the clusters which is found under the top of the river onto your northwest. The, both the land use and the, the figure ground ratio shows that it is sparsely dense. Um, plot sizes of the residential areas are big. There is a lot of greenery or they have their own shade of uh, backyard in the front yard whatever is grown into their backyard is also goes as an offering to the to the uh, jain temples the these are some of the photographs of the basadis basadis are the are nothing but jain temples which are of different sizes they though they have a similar kind of a typology built in laterite stone uh, what is unique is that every most of the Jain Bastis have their own water systems or the man-made tanks, uh, uh, which which uh, basically caters to the requirement not only for the uh, for the temples but also for the community surrounding uh, the temple complexes. The uh, while doing the uh, the case studies or the while carrying out the documentation and also mapping the the listing uh, emerged or the list the kind of listing what emerged was that there are 18 bastis, of which two bastis are uh, a private property, rest are governed and managed by the, the Jain pontiff who resides there. Uh, the other temples, as Hindu temples, are in and around the, the opposite sides of the river. What you find under the left corner is the, the Chauta Palace, which I was talking about, a royal family. Uh, the biggest uh, basti is called as a thousand pillared basti, which you can see onto the left hand side. The rest all are loosely connected. There is no set hierarchy of uh, network. I mean, if you try to understand it spatially, but they are all linked by by uh, the ceremonial route, and they are there is a, the non, the non hierarchy of the open space itself uh, lends to it a charm as well as um, uh, a certain kind of rootedness to the place. Some glimpses of the, this is the thousand pillared hall. The photograph beneath is the Chauta Palace, which is now 
being restored. There's a lot, there's a conservation work which is being undertaken for the last few years. Some of the glimpses of the, the these are the compound wall of the, the typical compound wall, which is almost like all the temple complexes are gated. They have a compound wall, which is high, quite high uh, with respect to, though the entry is very um, low profile, but then they all have a compound wall. So this is distinct uh, uh, I mean, feature of the Basitis. Interestingly, you do not find these kind of typologies of Jain temples or Basitis in Lakundi and other places in Karnataka. It is very unique to the place uh, in Mudbitri. List of bastis, you can see there are many bastis uh, of uh, which has been, you can see that there is a shared typological character uh, and a lot of vegetation growth. Yes, I wouldn't say that there is 100% maintenance happening by the, the trust, or but yes, uh, a lot of work needs to be undertaken. If one tries to understand the oral tradition, the intangible part of it, the oral traditions, um, you can see that the Vala text is well preserved, well copied into other languages, and a lot of research is undertaken by not only the monks, but also the researchers who come there. Different kind of performing arts uh, uh, dots this particular sacred landscape, uh, of which Yakshagana, Bhutakulla, and Huli Vesha are some of the traditional uh, dance and the drama uh, forms are found in the Uttar, Uttar Kannada. Other type of festivals, uh, Navaratri, of course, is, is, is a festival of India, but Nagaradhane and uh, other festivals and uh, are of Jains, uh, Rathod Sava is, is um, uh, an important feature. The food, the, the food uh, products, uh, especially because this is an area which is, a, which is also called as a rice belt, so you find different kind of unique uh, cuisines. Uh, which is, which is uh, enjoyed by the people and, and also the tourists around there. Based on the, these are some of the products which is made, uh, which, are, which are made, but yes, it does not find its market to, to a, to a, and does not have a larger reach. Uh, it requires certain kind of uh, marketing, which is not happening. And uh, of course, this is not a tourist place. This is a pilgrimage town and you only see pilgrims coming when there are uh, important events happening there. Summing up to, if I need to understand uh, the, what is the integrity of the place? So I would put it, sum it, uh, that it, it, the uninterrupted tradition of Jain religious practices in all the 18 Mastis here establishes its integrity and the spirit of the place is intact due to the continued religious and spiritual practices over a period of many centuries. And uh, the other important thing being that the manuscripts are enshrined in one of the Basadis. And um, in terms of its uh, spatial configuration, the cluster of 18 Basadis, which are situated under the bank of River Falguni, though they are loosely connected, uh, it has a non-hierarchical community open spaces. And all are linked by means of a ceremonial route. And uh, there is, uh, the life happens in these spaces and uh, be it its daily ordinary, religious activities or processions during annual festivals, um, uh, it, it adds value and richness to the place. The rustic simplicity of lifestyle of the community reflects in their habitat, which are built in laterite with slope roofs and tile. The building both fabric as well as the monumental structure seems to express a common form of life, a common way of being on the earth, expressing the community's unique identity. While understanding uh, the entire landscape, applying the actual um, approach or actual definition, uh, I found that this could help me or facilitate me to align the findings and uh, help in recognizing and mainstreaming uh, the cultural heritage of this place as a driver and an enabler for sustainable development in the process of implementing UN Agenda 2030. As UNESCO recommendation goes that HUL or historic urban landscape provides with an approach and tool to ensure culture in all forms in an, is an enabler and a driver of sustainable development. The, the research involved a wider contextual analysis of Mudabidri, uh, ranging from conferences, surveys, mapping of the city's natural and cultural uh, resources, 
It also included social and cultural practices, value assessment, understand the economic processes, the intangible dimensions. Uh, and then what followed was the recommendation, the strategies which followed uh, included the protection and management uh, and sustainable transformation of both the natural setting as well as uh, the cultural uh, heritage. And, uh, and this also incorporated the assessment of the vulnerable status of the cultural landscape. Like many other historical cities, uh, Mudabidri is also subjected to a lot of pressure. The urban development is one of the major pressures which the place is witnessing. To, you can see some of the photographs under the top. These are the kind of development uh, one can witness is in Mordubidri and uh, very close to the, uh, the, tem the temple precincts. Uh, while what you can see beneath is the, this is the kind of a vegetation uh, which you find under the bank of the river. Rivers are getting dried up. Interestingly, even though it sits under the bank of the river, Mordubidri was declared as a drought prone uh, for various reasons, and uh, there are many schemes which are which the government intends to take up to uh, to develop and to protect the river, uh, as well as the series or the water systems which is prevailing there in the form of man-made and uh, uh, natural water systems. This is a zoom-in map of the clusters of vastis, which which. Uh, which I have shared before. And uh, eventually this led to delineating a boundary for, for defining the, the protection as well as the regulatory zone. What you see in pink is the protected boundary in and around the clusters of uh, 18 basities and also the water systems. Onto your extreme right corner is the a cluster where you have the monasteries of Jain saints. Even people do not go there, but it is also an important part of the cultural landscape. Onto the left, onto the left uh, corner, uh, the the, the Chauta Palace, as I said, the family still stays there. The restoration is happening, and they intend to open up a part of the palace as a museum. The the area what you see in yellow was the proposed area for which roughly runs into ninety. Uh, uh, around 100 hectares of land, which was delineated, and uh, various uh, projects and uh, strategies were developed based on the requirement and the aspirations of the people, based on the uh, the dialogue with the with the, the head of the Jain community, and uh, and also. So I will quickly run through the uh, strategies which were listed out. Proposed management boundaries for protection of sacredness of the precinct, which I have already shown. Uh, a comprehensive blue-green strategy was uh, evolved, which included desilting of the river as a part of the integral part of the program, delineation of a productive landscape under forest buffer, uh, linking the water system and green network with the inner streets of Jain Basati's ceremonial route, and improved river ghat close to the Hindu complex. Comprehensive mobility plan strategy involved enhancing the existing public realm and linking with the proposed connected network of open spaces as a linear accessible green corridor covering the clusters of Jain temples onto the left uh, left left side of the uh, of the town, the edge uh, and the, the river edge and then the cemeteries of the saints and as well as the Chauta Palace. There are four ceremonial routes which crisscrosses the town. Four more heritage walks were worked out in a manner that, um, which could cater to the tourists, not the pilgrims, the tourists as well, uh, to take them along or to open up or to unfold the entire, the richness of the place through these kind of trails. Uh, aiming at sustainable human-centered tourism involves uh, reviving and enhancing the existing, existing cultural routes which connects to the nearby Buddhist sites there are, as I said, there are 18 more Buddhist sites uh, in and around Mudabitri. And uh, the idea is to, cultural, uh, to enhance these cultural routes and connect them to the nearby Jain uh, pilgrimage centers. Identified uh, uh, vernacular structures uh, have been proposed to accommodate infrastructure to cater to the needs of not only pilgrims, but also to the Jain monks. Um, and also uh, to, to house the local museum showcasing the cultural heritage of the region. Uh, 
looking at the heritage as an enabler for livelihood opportunities, have the, the craft training centers uh, is proposed to support the contemporary demands and marketing and logistics to support the local crafts community. The urban design guidelines are essential. Um, we're looking at the fast phase of development, which is uh, taking a toll onto the, uh, the, and onto the very sanctity of the place. Um, and public realm uh, this, uh, strategy, strategy needs to be worked out. Um, and uh, so that the guidelines will look at uh, the development, which is low rise and low density, especially close to the Basadi area. And the any new construction uh, adopts the local construction technology and material that is laterite. And um, looking at the visual perception uh, analysis, uh, the care uh, has, has to be taken so that uh, the other structures, which is high rise, uh, does not uh, endanger the, the, the integrity of the precinct. Um, this is my last slide, which sums up the recommendation. Uh, number one, sustaining the spirit of the place through uh, responsible urban development, number one raise awareness of the embedded values and dissemination through festivals, cultural routes, walk trails, museums and workshop, as well as research facilities. Protection of natural system and process as the only way to maintain the sacredness of cultural landscape through declaring biodiversity zone and green zone. Inclusion of cultural, natural and intangible heritage in the urban development policy and program. Active participation of the local community, religious heads, in the establishing the significance of the embedded values for the delineation, development, protection, management, and monitoring of the sacred site, and preparing well-tested and progressive indicators for measuring preservation, protection, conservation of all cultural and natural heritage at the national, regional, and the community level. Thank you. Thank you very much for so precise covering so Thank many you, topics sir. in so many ways. And then the most wonderful thing is that uh, this is completed exactly within time. So that is another Geetanjali. So you have uh, uh, submitted that uh, love, affection, and concern of time exactly. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, so that was, again, it is like co-shared pilgrimage. Uh, in the land of Karnataka and with a case study. So now we are going to start with uh, our first speaker who will join that. Uh, and we have a question with Gitanjali now. now. So let me request Professor M. Sadish Kumar to present his paper. Before that, I can introduce, I have already mentioned about him, but let me say at this junction, the Director of Internationalization, Faculty of Engineering and Physical Science. Professor of Geography, and uh, he is in fact a leading international expert on colonial and post-colonial studies focused on South Asia, covering many areas across social sciences and humanities. He was also involved in such projects like Rule of Heritage in Zero Carbon Footprint, Wajuli, and Roadside Shrines and Popular Religious Icons, uses and Vedic and post-Vedic gods from early to urban India. And more than that, as an activist, he was involved in several uh, such projects and mission to upgrade the life of sufferers or those who are marginalized people. And it is a great honor for him, for us, and for whole India also, that uh, on the World uh, International Day of uh, Peace, that is uh, on 2nd October, Mahatma Gandhi's birthday, He's going to be uh, honored by the government, the highest Irish award for his work in Ireland and the community. So, so now I'm going to request to uh, Professor Fish Kumar to go ahead and the only humble request will be, <laughs> you can cover the whole thing, but if you can do within 20 minutes, that will be great help. Shatishji. Satish ji, hello? Yes. 
Professor oh, Satish Kumar. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's fine now. Yeah, yeah. I'm sharing my screen. Is that okay? Okay, okay. Uh, are you able to see my slide? Yeah. yeah. That's okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rana, and uh, for the opportunity to share some thoughts. So I'm going to take, uh, uh, before I start uh, going to the details and give you a sort of a panoramic uh, a drone footage of the areas that I've done my research and field work for the last couple of years. I just thought I'd give some uh, introductory remarks before I start into the, the opportunity to listen to some interesting um, uh, sort of speeches from Joyce Sen and Shika and others. And I think a few things which came up from that particular discussions was the area in terms of performance, ideas of performativity, performance, about associational values, the role of parampara, uh, deep heritage, uh, and the context of uh, how this deep heritage is manifested in cultural landscapes. What I'm going to do is also looking at the two sites, the survival of heritage from the mangroves of Sundarbans to in Assam. The idea here, I would like to look at the cultural heritage. And I ask this question, what matters most for us is to maintain, for us to maintain our identity as to who we are and where we are from. And that's where cultural heritage becomes really crucial. It is providing the cultural heritage, both tangible and intangible, and forces us to look at the interrelationship between space, idioms, symbols, and social power. And these are my areas of, of interest in this particular research that I've been undertaking. So without going into too much details, we already know what it stands for. I'm going to skip this, but I want to pick up some ideas about the whole notion of cultural resources, cultural heritage, cultural connection, and what is it that gives us great uh, pride in our culture. It's our ability to connect from one generation to another. And that's the point that I'm trying to make, the ability to connect from one generation to another that gives, gives them their most valued attribute and the inherent capacity to mold and reinforce identities as social features. So when we are looking at the whole cultural heritage includes traditions or living expressions inherited from our ancestors and passed on to our descendants, such as oral traditions, performing arts, social practices, etc., And therefore, heritage is a likely ally to cultural heritage, a cultural identity. At the same time, what we find is there's a gradual erosion and destruction of heritage, and which has far reaching impact on the sustainability of communities across the world. So when I was in these areas, understanding the role of cultural heritage, climate change, etc., I realized that, and I started thinking and realized that life the transformation of life into matter is what transforms, what brings into reality the concept of cultural heritage, transforming life into matter. And I'm just picking up the, the, the last sentence and last ideas of Joyce and then extending it to my own explanation that when we look at the whole combination of prana and akasha, the energy and matter together, we have the manifestation of temples, we have the manifestation of cultural landscapes, and cultural heritage landscape. So that's where I would like to start from in terms of a common theme. At the same time, we find that environmental and social impacts have huge, have huge social uh, interactions have huge impacts uh, on the people and the community as well, and impacts on the cultural aspirations. Some of the most misunderstood elements in this whole debate has been about intangible cultural resources. And I'm going to bring that into my presentation. There is little agreement that spiritual heritage too forms an integral part of cultural heritage and tradition. And the value attached to cultural heritage, while deeply personal, are also communal in nature and is directly linked to the traditional knowledge systems. So my research has been largely in the most ecologically fragile zones of India. And I was supposed to be in Bangladesh conducting the same research when the COVID-19 happened so the entire area had to be, that particular exercise had to be postponed to another date. So uh, let me come very quickly into the first of my cultural heritage where I did my work was largely in Sundarbans. I spent uh, 2010 to 2011, 2012 
researching in Sundarbans and working in Sundarbans and understanding how Sundarbans, uh, how the community in Sundarbans, how they were managing with climate change. And recently we had the Ampa, the, the, the major cyclone which devastated after Ayala, Ampan was one of the most devastating cyclones. So again, in Sundarbans, what we observed is the, the addition, the existence of intangible heritage was much more prominent. Um, let me give you a big background, a short background. Uh, Sundarbans, which is in the Indian part of Sundarbans, is mostly composed of cluster of low-lying islands in the Bay of Bengal, spread across India and Bangladesh. It covers almost 40,000 square kilometers. It is one of the active deltaic regions of the world. It's one of the largest deltaic regions of the world. So here we find that the Sundarban forest covers about 10,000 square kilometers across India and Bangladesh, of which 40% lies in India and the 60% is in Bangladesh. It is home to the Royal Bengal tiger, the crocodiles, the water lizards, and the gangetic dolphins, unique species in that part of the world. What we also observe is that the forest uh, here in, in, in the Sundarban side of it, uh, they have, as I said, access to cultural resources means how people can learn about, not can learn not only about their own immediate ancestors, but also about the traditions as well. So very quickly, when looking at the whole site of it, Sundarbans communities, they are trying to sustain their living. So there's a sustainable living concept, which has emerged among the people of Sundarbans and across the island of Sundarbans. But what is also interesting for me was that we find that the, the putting people and their cultural heritage in the center has to become the debate now. Contemporary economic and social significance is important, but at the same time, significance of the individual sites of the monuments, which are under severe threat in regional historic terms need to be brought into the forefront. Sometimes what we observe is that there's a largely and ignored, largely ignored is the relationship of individual monuments to their context. And we find this right across the board. So again, enabling communities to meet their own needs, if we don't allow them, not enabling the community to meet their own needs, it is likely to kill local initiatives and to build dependencies. So again, how do you look at the, the communities? How do they manage their cultural identities? How do they maintain their livelihood in the context of these islands? But I want to take this few minutes. This is an image of uh, uh, a worshiping area, a local shrine, which is called Bon Bibi. Most of you may be aware of it. Bon Bibi here have both the Hindus and the Muslims praying to Bon Bibi before going into the forest to collect wild honey, to collect crabs and shrimps, etc., and fish as well. And Sundarban, if you look at it, Sundarban in, is without the Bon Bibi, Sundarban doesn't have his ritualistic identity. This is a deity of the forest and it's a scent character of Bon Bibi Palgan, a musical drama which is unique to Sundarbans. And even after the Ampan happened, or the cyclone happened, people felt that they were saved because of Bon Bibi. There are almost 30, 30 groups that perform the Bon Bibi, bon Bibi Palgan in various islands throughout the year. And it is done between the, within the village communities, and it was fascinating to see that it is such an important aspect of the lives of this particular island. The spaces where the Palgan is conducted used to be a, a common uh, sort of a common area for all the villagers to come together. But we find that, that the cyclonic destruction has made this activity extremely impossible. But also at the same time, we find that most of the people pray to the Bon Bibi before doing any activity. It's part of their culture. It's an intangible culture that exists there. Now, because of the pandemic and everything else, people are not able to go and undertake activities. The tourism is also completely destroyed. The other hidden heritage of, 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 this, uh, of Sundarbans is what I call the Puthis, Puthis of Sundarbans, which is quite unique in terms of its documentation, it has been a project which I conducted to see how to preserve and conserve these ancient manuscripts, which is there in the Sundarbans. Uh, there was almost about 190 manuscripts that I was involved with. If you look at the state of these manuscripts, completely destroyed. I worked with the British Library 
as a, as a pilot project to see how to preserve and conserve these documents. Uh, just to give you a bit, a bit of a background, the Endangered Archives Program of 759 was a 10 months project. We looked at 175 manuscripts uh, and we covered quite a significant area to see what we could do. We had the documents that we found, the puthis that we found was quite unique in the regional museum. It is mostly held by families, private families. Sometimes they're collected together because generations have disappeared. They're mostly made of handmade paper using black ink. And also we have some of the documents in palm leaf and machine made paper. It covers a period of 17th to 20th century AD and is absolutely unique in terms of this. It mostly covers Hindu philosophies of the Sapta and the Vaishnava traditions. And Puthis are quite unique in the sense that it has uh, documentation of the Mangal Kapya, the Ramayana, the Mahabharatas. And I have documented this and also preserved some of those 19 detailed Puthis. Accumulation of dust, damage, insect damage, rodent attack, mold, etc., has destroyed most of these materials. So we are looking at how to restore this material, which is disappearing fast in the place. So some examples of this, we have examples of documentation of the Puthis, of the Mahabharata, of Gita Govinda, of Durga Puja, Padhati, and Kausandika and others. So there is a huge collection of tangible heritage in this region, which is completely getting lost. So again, raising awareness of what we can do. Some of the restoration that we have done, you can see the examples of the restoration that we have collected. The next project that we undertook was in the, in the Majuli on the Brahmaputra River. Uh, Joyce had mentioned about the Brahmaputra River and I just want to again talk about why Majuli has such a, I've spent about three, four years working on Majuli. Majuli lies in the Brahmaputra River, the world's highest sediment bearing water course. The island is unique, outstanding, in terms of cross-cultural diversity with a unique and continuous existence since the 16th century. It is uh, such a unique site that uh, when I went there, I went with the intention to look at the site to understand what are the hidden heritage in Majuli and how we can help to protect it, to conserve it. We looked at the cultural landscape of that, looking at both the tangible and intangible. We looked at the biodiversity of that area. We looked at the, the people, the festivals, uh, and looked at what can be done to support the proposition for the Nat World Heritage. I know Shika mentioned it, but I want to take, a, take you into the depths of this beautiful culture that I wanted to highlight to you, the tradition, as I said. So location-wise, as a geographer, we need to see where the location is. These are the Satras. They were almost, as I said, this island is a living testimony of 500 years old cultural heritage. There used to be close to about 70 odd satras or monasteries in this place and the red dots there reflects the monasteries there right across the bank of the Brahmaputra. Of the 75, only 28 exist today. The rest have disappeared. Disappeared due to climate change, disappeared due to so many factors, generational transformation, etc. The next, of course, is as I said, just continuing with the, the, the floods have been devastating in this region every year, annual cycles of flood. The, the cultural heritage gets under severe pressure because of recurrent floods and damage to property and land. So current area, population-wise, 167,000. There are two, the, mix, the mixed ethnic groups that you find are Mishings, the Deoris and the Sonovals. It is a center of the neo Vaishnavite culture. This is quite unique because they pray to the book the neo Vaishnavite culture of Shivanta Shankardev prays to the book. The book, the Granthi, is the source of, of the sacredness, and everything revolves around it. It's a low lying topography with annual flooding and erosion. Um, catchment area, as I said, I don't want to go into too much details, but just give you some insights. They have uh, the satras, the monasteries that are there, are unique because they, they perform a very uh, specific function for the communities. For instance, on the right hand side, you have the, the examples of mass making. The four days festival, which happens on the first full moon after Diwali is called the Ras Festival. I've done participated in two such Ras Festivals, it runs for four days. It is absolutely incredible. 
talking about the life of Sri Krishna, going through live performance, which starts at 9.30 in the evening and goes all the way to 4 o'clock, 4.30 in the morning. And everywhere in the community, 2,000 to 3,000 people are sitting and watching and performing the, the Sri Krishna Leela continuously for four days. Uh, again, examples of that, which you can see the cultural heritage. Mask making is a unique mask making activity that is conducted here in the Gormur Satra. Majuli Heritage Complex, you can see all the dance forms, which are influenced by Sri Mantra Shankar Dev, the, the vernacular architecture, that has emerged in this part is also unique. So when we look at the relevance of Marjuli in the climate change discussions, I just want to direct your attention to what uh, that cultural heritage is both impacted by climate change and a source of resilience for communities. Heritage side, as well as local communities, intangible heritage knowledge practices constitute an invaluable repository of information strategies to assess climate change, even while those resources are themselves at risk. So what has come out of it? I realized that we have to have some benchmarking of the satras. I have to conduct benchmarking exercise and to co collate information about the, the tangible and the intangible heritage in this region. What I also found that during the RAS festival, there's an incredible use of plastics and plastics were polluting the Brahmaputra river, plastic was polluting the entire island. So I started the process of sensitization, raising awareness, a plastic mukt majuli program and initiated dialogues across stakeholders, festival organi organizers and heads of the monasteries to initiate a zero plastic option, promoting baths. The image on the side here is an image, a local artist who had done it. So I joined hands with the Living Arts Festival. I promoted jute bags against plastics and increased the sensitization drive against indiscriminate use of single-use plastics. Set up special stalls during the festivals, providing opportunities there. So co-designed with the Marty Center, uh, an NGO to develop a zero plastic campaign, a five days living arts festival with art competition, singing competition, dance competition, storytelling seminar, art installation, and the use of organic materials. And also had the boats. The, one of the slides I showed you boats, we painted it to raise awareness. So here's one example and providing livelihood options to local artisans who are makers of bags through bamboo products and musicians. Living Art Festival became very successful. Uh, it was covered across the media. Pottery was used as an alternative and dance forms in the festival, we use all of them. So it was absolutely incredible experience of working with them. So in a way, sustainable development targets were achieved promoting entrepreneurship, creativity, innovation, and job creation in the heritage sector through formalization of their creative enterprise, promoting sustainable tourism that creates jobs, promoting local culture and products, and cultural inclusion, including all communities, including the, the Mishmis, the Deoris, and others in the natural heritage. So Satras, as a tangible archaeological and living heritage, became a, a very important source of inspiration for all of us. Satras, as a repository of material culture, became, we, we documented this, we listed them, so that tomorrow, if there's a flood, they will know what are the materials that they had to, to protect and survive. So in a way, these boats were used to, across the island to spread the message of uh, plastic mug majuli in the island. We also had art competition, as I said, which gives you an example of how plastics was used for the art festival. Source of resilience. So here's something which came out very interestingly in the process. We realized, I went with the idea that we, these people in the island needs help. I realized it came back much more chastised. I realized that the people of the island knows how to live with floods. They look at floods as friends because floods regenerate the local economy. They are not scared of floods. They are scared of development, which can prevent them from having that knowledge. So in the process of the floods, every year, adaptation strategies that they, they had, they also built resilience to deal with floods uh, every year. So, in a way, when I look at the whole aspect of Majuli and Sundarbans, I want to bring, bring forth some quick uh, summary of whole things that I just mentioned and provide you with some perspectives and thoughts as to how to deal with these areas. So each of the mo monasteries, for instance, the Aunati Monastery was famous for Palnam and Apsara dances, the Dakhinpath Satra, where, which is the largest and the oldest monastery, Satras, 
was prime venue for the Ras festival, Ras Mahotsav. The Samugri uh, Satra was famous for mask making, Gormur for traditional medieval weapons and cannons. Kamalavari was known for making best boats. So you can see art and culture and tradition came together in this cultural landscape. He also had songs and dances which were initiated by Sri Shankar Dev, Shimanta Shankar Dev, and the Borgit, the concert of Borgit, and Jumura, Chali, Palnam, all of these traditional concepts were introduced, dance forms, etc., were introduced. So it is quite a fascinating site, and I'm very proud to say that I've had complete support from the local community to achieve the targets of, of providing sustainable alternatives to the people of this island. So the survival of cultural heritage has to be a concerted activity based on committed funding and a political will based on willingness by all stakeholders. Indeed, while climate change is already impacting communities and heritage globally, these, trend, these trends are predicted to worsen and have adverse effect over a period of time. So when people are displaced and disconnected from the places that they value, there's a strong evidence that their cultures are diminished and many cases endangered. So sometimes development could also result in maladaptation, which is always likely to occur when cultural dimensions of climate change is not taken into account. No culture, no community, no region is immune from climate risks. Evaluating climate risk in the heritage context requires managers to develop an understanding of how the main physical climate drivers interact with each other in causing impacts. Creating a common risk profile is absolutely important. Also, how these impacts affect cultural significance and carriers of cultural values is most significant. And finally, to explain how cultural heritage can contribute to climate solutions through risk management, uh, adaptation, Professor, and resilience. Professor Sadish Kumar, sir, may I request you to kindly yeah, finish, I'm just yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, that's, sir. That's, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Professor Rana, sir, kindly continue. Okay, so it's got some here. Ah, okay, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Satish Ji, for uh, giving us the glimpse of Mazli Island and all the deeply rooted uh, cultural perspectives, attributes, and uh, all those uh, uh, niches related to that, uh, which was very important for us because that is now uh, going to be the heritage, UNESCO inscribed heritage site. This way, that is very important. And you are taking the lead of the whole group. So that is another important thing that we have learned. So now, now uh, we are going to the next speaker. So may I will welcome architect Farnaz Farazi. Okay, you are here? Okay, so yes, I can say yes. salam. So, okay, I can say salam, ale salam alaikum to you and uh, <laughs> most welcome in this. Thank yeah, you. and uh, I think uh, Elham is also here. Your uh, co-author, Elham. Yeah, I'm just... No, okay. she isn't here. I'm just the only presenter. Oh, okay, okay, okay. She so may be listening on the Facebook. Okay, so Farnas is uh, doing work uh, on the heritage conservation aspect, and now she's uh, at the final stage of submitting PhD at the University of Tehran and her research interest include heritage urban landscape full, that is the UNESCO big debate nowadays, cultural landscape, adaptive reuse of historical buildings. So taking this perspective into mind, she is going to present uh, her study of the historical villages of the East Azerbaijan. Okay, thank yes. you, most welcome. Okay. Thank you. It's an honor. It's an honor for me to participate in such a very good uh, webinar. Thank you, Professor Rana. And uh, may I share my screen? Uh, do you have my voice? It's 
excuse me, can I share my screen? Yeah, Just share. Good. Thank you. Well, today I want to speak about my um, one of the, my um, major interests in culture uh, in cultural landscapes and their conservation. The challenge that are uh, that our historical landscapes are, especially rural ones, are facing, and the integrated conservation and development in such cases. And I will uh, speak about uh, village historic villages in is in East Azerbaijan province of Iran. Well, uh, as all of us are um, familiar with the importance of conservation and maintenance of uh, cultural assets, as well as development and improvement in rural and urban areas. I think um, it has raised several challenges in uh, planning processes. Due to the uh, rural development plan, natural and man-made uh, environments in place contribute as a united system in which each of components has a mutual interaction therefore change in one of which will affect the other um it is widely accepted that the notion of conservation has existed from a solid and result-based approach applicable in the ma maintenance of physical features of a historical environment to a community-based and holistic approach, which includes the concept of change management. So here uh, it is my, uh, my main point of in interest and research. Here, NOCO states that economic, social, cultural, and environmental systems are not isolated and correlated with one another. And in the meantime, cultural heritage could perform as a glue between different aspects of sustainable development. So basically, regarding to the notion of change management as an ongoing procedure in the context of monuments, sites, and areas monitoring, controlling, and managing historical environments is an obligatory responsibility of decision makers here. Due to the prevention of negative impacts of modern socioeconomic conditions, which are affecting our density, integrity and cultural significance of heritage, I wanted to um, look through the historical rural landscapes. In identifying the existing challenges of historical areas during the conservation procedure can be countered as one of the necessary milestones to achieve the best results in management and identification of these environments. By this means, managers can describe exact setbacks and issues of the sites and provide sustained suitable solutions for existing problems to achieve a balance. So integrated management of conservation and development chains in historical rural landscapes have developed by the historical urban landscape introduction in the international con conservation literature. This new approach contributes to a new paradigm in cultural landscape management. Smith states this concept as a new intellectual framework, a new paradigm for thinking about work in an era moving beyond modernism. Cultural and natural assets are not isolated boxes to be protected. They underlie a way of understanding the work. So, uh, my studies about rural historic landscapes and the approach that we can conserve them and manage them has caused, um, has um, goes back to the first uh, first documents that was published and introduced in 1990s by the National Park Service of USA, where they had defined the rural uh, the term of rural historic landscapes as a geographical area that historically has been used by people or shared or shaped or modified by human activity, occupancy or intervention. And that poses a significant concentration linka linkage or vegetation, buildings and structures, routes and waterways and natural features. 
However, this introduced approach um, seemed to me that cannot be generalized to every landscape, especially in the Iranian cases, because there are uh, multiple challenges and issues that we are forcing in um, national in contemporary time. So it conceptualized a rural landscape as its isolated landscapes with a solitary emphasis on their historical value of historic landscape. Um, after this um, approach and definition, I was looking for to find another a good framework for my research. I had come to uh, another um, approach, historic rural landscapes that are uh, studied based on HUL, historic urban landscapes, and they face the challenge on rural areas based on the HUL approach. Um, in this approach, the historic rural landscapes, the concept of the historic rural landscapes um, is uh, emphasize rural landscapes as a landscape which have built as a result of the rec uh, reciprocal relationship between man and nature. Nature in this concept is according is shaped according to the basic needs of humans, inherited and in intrinsic acts, and knowledge of people to create the living spaces. Likewise, the behaviors of people are shaped by natural and man-made built environment that each community member responds to the change and develop individual and collective behaviors, acts, and identities. This mutual and continuous relationship starts when the first the man first interacts with the nature and goes on as long as both of the components are alive and active. So when we were proceeding with this study, we have come along with two main questions. First, what challenges are facing in the conservation of historical rural landscapes? And second, how are challenges faced affecting rural, rural historical landscapes? These two, uh, these two questions, we try to answer these two questions during this study. So uh, to identify challenges of historical rural landscapes, we have referred to two main references one of which is a report start, reported study which focused on challenges of world heritage sites investigated challenges in, inscribed sites in the world heritage list from 1994 to 2005 and held by ecoms so this study classifies challenges in eight main categories and 79 substational classes in the second phase, we have studied national and international practices and categorizing challenges in three levels of global, national, and local challenge. Inefficient development plans and their def defective implementation on Iran, non-professional managers and authorities, massive demographic change during decades, especially in the young generations, loss of uh, local economic activities like different ag agricultural methods, animal husbandry, and et cetera, are the main challenge in local scale in Iran. What? However, rules and regulations can be described as, nas as national issues in the management of heritage. Also, industrialization, change in way of life, and tourism industry or along with urbanization are global cases that we have found in the study. So uh, referring back to the introduced categories of challenges by ECOMOS, they are consisting of deterioration, development, extraction of resources, large scale development projects, tourism, cultural change, social, economical, national infrastructure, local on-site management deficiencies. So we have uh, we led our study by uh, making a questionnaire and filling them uh, with uh, with the help of stakeholders and beneficials, especially uh, local lo local residents local residents of our case studies. 
Our case studies consist of four villages in the northwest of Iran called as, here is the map, uh, called as Shubin village in the for top of the Iran, uh, Zunuzar village, um, Kandawan village, and Churagil village. All of these have the same cultural and historical roots, same mountainous structures and climate conditions. However, they have different development plans, authorities, and are under varied tourism pressure. So, our studies shows that the first and the most important challenge in these four cases is rural sprawler. Profession suggested that setbacks in national laws and regulations are the foremost reason for this um, challenge, especially an act in Iran, which called as tertiary ter reformation adopted in 1964. Here we, uh, we saw cases in both Ushtabin and Charagil uh, villages. This, this act, do you have my voice? Okay, uh, I proceed. I don't know. Can you hear me? Yes, 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 go ahead. Oh, thank you. Well, our studies shows that, um, okay, and this act, uh, the terrestrial reformation, which has adopted in 1964, shows that the, uh, the, the um, shows uh, the most affected um, act in, and law in, or in rural fabrics. As you can see in this slide, an example, an, an example of the law's consequences is um, apparent in the Ushtabin relates. The change in the area of the village and its expansion is evident through aerial um, photographs. In three different time spans, you can see how it has changed. Um, I want to consider your, um, I want to have a focus on this uh, image and you can see that how they have developed and the structure and fabric of the village has uh, developed uh, without any uh, regulations or without any organizations um, through the years. It's here, uh, here it is an um, aerial photography from the village in 1950s. And we saw a little more expansions in, in 2000s. And there is somehow, it is somehow uh, its current situation. And you can see how the, a structure of the village has uh, existed from its uh, original and primary state. So, um, industrialization, modernization, and urbanization changed the rules of cities before villages. Once in time, villages were productive areas of the country in Iran that provided the required service for cities. What It is worse. So, based on this change, nowadays villages have the consequence of such a phenomenon. Materials which are used in the buildings of a new in the building in the construction of new buildings here. This uh, this led villages to have pre-urban structure rather than their initial and authentic structure and uh, landscape. Also, some. Uh, also, some natural disasters like earthquakes, which are mostly happening in Iran and Azerbaijan region, are another reason for construction reformations. Because after such catastrophic events, uh, residents prefer to build new buildings, adjust to the later one, not they're considering their restoration or reconstruction, the former ones the, or the existing dwellings. So we face in uh, most of the villages with such uh, with such uh, dual and uh, converse uh, images of the new buildings beside of the um, historic ones. 
another most important challenge in Iranian uh, in, uh, in in our cases in our studied cases is loss of economic activity local economic activity uh, which is a serious this really serious issue in our historical rural landscapes conservation since they affect residents in residents employment and encourage them to migrate to near cities to find a new job by this means village to turn to be completely consumer societies rather than producing as you you can see in this picture, uh, the bazaar of the rural bazaar of one of the villages has been closed totally because their economical um, economical activities has been closed and they have and they just forget their own methods of producing um, economical products or, or to service other um, near villages. One of the activities that was really popular in this um, village was um, turning um, some wools to the to the products for uh, making clothes. Um, in case of uh, infrastructure and environmental challenges, we face that weak infrastructure structure besides environmental problems like lack of sewage disposal climate change flooding the rivers is are from the several challenges that need that needed to be considered in this village for example in the ustobin village we uh, we have a river in the in the in the um, in the focal point of the village, but uh, the attempts to provide uh, some uh, securities in order to um, prevent their um, their flow and um, resisting their uh, their destructions is not is an in, is neglected through the years. Also. We have social and cultural issues like lack of awareness, um, change in the rural ways of life to become more urbanized, particularly in Kandaman and Churagil case studies, uh, which impacted the rural historic landscapes. And finally, there is an unmanaged tourism pressure. Tourism led many villages to be artificial crafts rather than to Rather than, rather than help them to conserve their initial essence. The tourism industry, especially in Kandawan and Zonuza, led restoration to be more artificial. Many residents have changed their primary business to service tourism, tourists. Also, in the case of intangible village values, many cultural and religious rituals aimed um, rituals aim um, turned to the advantage of the tourists. To sum up, it is concluded that most of the contemporary challenges in the studied cases have roots in local and national deficiencies rather than the global one. And they are like cha chains, they are uh, consequences and reasons for one and another. Uh, for example, industrializations in urban cities, in urban fabrics, um, led to the loss of local, local economic activities. This forced um, urban, young generation to migrate to the cities, and after that, some of them has, has faced with unemployment. Also, change in lifestyles and unsuitable development plans uh, besides of the management deficiencies uh, makes this a challenge to be more overwhelmed in the rural landscapes. So at the end, here is our conceptual framework. So here, historical rural landscapes are formed as a result of the re reciprocal relationship between the man and man. They are alive since they have conserved their equilibrium. Change is a part of their living circumstances and they will be alive as much as they find the balance between the change and the significance as its sense. So here uh, we find that here almost all of these challenges that we have uh, found them, we asked for them, are some part of a change and they can be neglected through our um, 
you know, sort of through the life of these landscapes. And there should be, uh, there shouldn't be marginalized or uh, obstacled to happen. They should be, uh, to, they should be blessed with uh, the values and the significance that we are now have in our lives. It is not the only manager's rules to do them, but also it's uh, it's a responsibility for the local residents that we can produce them by just um, by um, accelerating by uh, but by giving help from local residents and um, achieving their uh, participation. So thank you for your uh, consideration and time and excuse me, my presentation is not really well. Thank you. <laughs> Very much, you are so modest that you said that uh, your presentation is not so good, but in our opinion, your presentation is superb. Thank in you. all the ways, in terms of time, in terms of coverage, in terms of messages, so thank you very much. And we were lacking from Iran in Ekla. Now you are going to be recommended to be honorary member of Ekla. Considering your this uh, work, you will be a member of the Ekla, okay? And we will give you a letter on certificate for that. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. So, Arnaz, for uh, such fine presentation. Now we have still a little bit time before we can start. Professor Michael Ziovine. So in the meantime, because still uh, we have 15, 12 minutes time. So in the meantime, he will follow exact time. So in the meantime, we are adjusting with another presentation and then Michael will join. Michael is already here. So for you, very good morning. And you have already got up at 15 minutes past four o'clock. Yeah. So we call it Brahma Muhurt a special time in the morning when you can meet the god yes so you <laughs> so and you you follow the path of saint peter so yeah. naturally you are most welcome in that perspective but Thank before you. that you have to do a little bit of yoga for 12 minutes concentrate in the meantime we have another presentation great okay my dear my dear michael i can i can think you can adjust with me as go pilgrim okay Good. yeah sure Okay, oh, okay. I'll wait. Okay, okay. okay. So now uh, let me request uh, Dr. Jyoti Rohila Rana, who is Senior Associate Professor in the History of Art and Tourism Management, Banaras Hindu University, and she has worked on Amarauti's landscape and heritage. And now she has done recently explorative study. So she's going to pre present her latest research based on landscape of Unakoti. Okay, please go ahead. Thank you, Professor Rana. Uh, can you hear me? And I'm going to share my screen. Is it visible? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Now, uh, it's, uh, I've been given an opportunity to talk uh, on my recent work, uh, recent research work, which I'm working on. And um, I'm finding it a little nervous because uh, amongst the cultural geographers and architects and such big names, I'm the only art historian who's uh, going to talk about it. And I'm going to take very little time just to give an introduction about the kind of work which I'm doing. And hopefully I'll be moving in the right direction. So to begin with, the topic of my presentation is the sacred cultural landscape of Unnakoti, a shared pilgrimage site of Tripura. So uh, Unnakoti, also known as Sabrai Khang in Kokbora, the Sino-Tibetan native uh, language of the Baroque people is an important pilgrimage site for the Shaivites and is also known as Unnakoti Tirtha. According to the archeological report, the Unnakoti pilgrimage site may be dated to 8th, 9th century CE. 
Located in the northeastern part of Tripura, it is 185 kilometers from Agartala and is known for huge rock cut sculptural reliefs carved on the high cliffs of the mountains amidst lush green landscape where the sacred stream of water flows, which is known as Unakoti Chara. And uh, Chara means water, a stream. It was first in 1914 that Captain Williams discovered the site. And in 1921, it was Archaeological Survey of India that took over the control of the area and declared it a protected monument. The undergoing study will try to focus on the art and cultural aspects first, because being an art historian, I'll be talking about uh, the art heritage, which is existing there, and then how the cultural uh, you know, legacy, which is uh, being taken care of over there by the locals uh, is very important. Thirdly, the religious aspect and the historical layering, you know, the religious and historical layering, which is very interesting, while giving the presentation, I'll be talking about that and its contribution in placemaking. So here you can see that um, in India, it is the extreme northeast uh, corner down below over here is Agartala. And uh, in Agartala, you can see it's on the upper north um, eastern part where Unakoti rock cut reliefs are. So uh, when we talk about Unnukoti, it's a site which is dedicated to Lord Shiva. And uh, not directly, but uh, you know, uh, in the local people, local people consider Sabrai Kung as the form of Shiva. And they say that the ancient most worship of Shiva is, which is still going on in continuation, is in Tripura region only. And uh, they have uh, many mythologies associated with it. They also say that Siba, the word Siba means, say, uh, uh, it means that a person who has the knowledge of five basic elements and that five basic elements are earth, fire, ether, sky, and water. So uh, besides that, you know, like the making of the site, when we talk about the making of the site, one of the most popular mythologies associated with it is that there was a, a person called Kalu Kumar, the local of that area, who was a sculptor and was a devotee of Parvati. And Once he wished and prayed Pradira Parvati to accompany Shiva and requested both of them to reside in this area, leaving their abode on Mount Kailash. On request of Parvati, Lord Shiva agreed, but only in one condition, that Kalu will have to make one crore sculptures of gods and goddesses, and that too in one night. Kali, Kalu Kumar undertook the task and spent all night in carving the images, but when the dawn broke, he could only finish one less than a crore. And this gave the reason to Shiva to leave him behind, along with all the images of gods and goddesses. So this is the mythology. And why these mythologies are important is because they are a major contributor, I feel. I mean, I'm learning the concept placemaking now, but these are the things which uh, you know contribute a lot in the placemaking. So I'm showing you some of the images uh, where you can see, I mean, why would the, uh, the people or the artists make many images of Shiva? That is not understandable. But while I was studying this, because most of the books which I refer to, they talked about that Shiva is represented in this form and that form, but why? So when uh, I started to study, you can see there are huge rock cut reliefs where this is the first one which you encounter. It is Jatadhari Shiva, who's mentioned, who is the only person who's mentioned as Sabraikhan. And this is a second image of Shiva, who's referred to as Punna Koteshwar Kala Bhaira. Then when you come down, it actually you have to follow the footsteps and you have to come down from here and in the middle of the valley, you see this image, which is uh, referred to as Unna Koteshwara. And what you can see is it's a complex iconography where you also see Parvati and another representation of the river. Generally, there is the river called Ganga, which is associated with Shiva. But there is another mythology where it says that while uh, uh, like all the gods and goddesses were asked to come to Unnakoti, it was Ganga who didn't come and said that I'll 
sent another variation of mine, and that was the river Gomati. So this is probably the representation of river Gomati. Then there are some other more images. Uh, this one is Kamadahan. This is Kiratarjun. This is very much defaced, so you cannot see it clearly. This is uh, why I'm showing you this is because you you saw on map Agartala, and uh, and uh, then you saw uh, you must be knowing where Assam is. So this is the image of Kamakya Devi, and the same kind of representation you find here, which is associated with fertility cult. And then you have another, when you come downhill and again in the valley, the stream flows down from here and you encounter the image of multiple Ganeshas, one seated Ganesha and two standing Ganesha and an image of Vishnu. Now, what is interesting about this image is, this image is the representation of the intermixing of their religious beliefs. So, uh, like many scholars have identified these two Ganesh images as female, uh, you know, images. But according to me, this is the representation of Ganesha in the form of Shiva because he's holding trident. And this is the representation of Ganesha as Vishnu because he's holding all the attributes of Vishnu. And then again, Vishnu is here. So this, what, why they started to, uh, like why they depicted this image is because they wanted to show that along with Shaivites, um, the Vaishnavites and also, uh, you know, the Shaivites and the Vaishnavites were moving together and along with the Devi cult. So these were the three cults, which were, you know, uh, parallelly going along together. Then this is a very interesting uh, portion where you find uh, on top of the Shiva head, you find this representation and I have tried to recreate it uh, on computer. So here you see one linga in the center, four around it, and then multiple lingas around it. So this is uh, the symbolic representation of Panch Mahabhutas, uh, the importance of that in the whole universe. And it is a metaphysical sense. These elements are not separated from each other. And this justifies the presence of both the symbolic and representational forms of these elements and the worship of Sibrai, Sibrai or Shiva at the Shaiv pilgrimage site. So uh, apart from this, uh, what I tried to find out is that these uh, Shiva, like the Panch Mahabhutas are represented by Shiva head one, Jatadhari Shiva, because uh, you see the flaring jatas, and that is the representation of air. You see Bhairava, who's ferocious. He is the representation of fire. Sadashiv is the representation of ether. Parvati and Gomati are the representation of water. And Nandi, who is associated with Shiva, is the representation of earth. There is, uh, as I stated, the importance of Punakoti is there as a pilgrimage site also because it is, uh, you know, uh, it is regarded as a very important site amongst uh, Tripuri people and it is known as uh, Unakoti Tirtha. Its mention is also there in Unakoti Tirth Mahatya. Later, it was also converted into Kapil Tirtha because of the austerity of Kapil Muni. We find in Varahi Tantra the reference that Shankara should be considered the deity of Unnakoti Tirtha and it is Vishwakarma who has given the shape of Unnakoti Kunda. Now this is very interesting here that further it says that the use of holy water for bathing, drinking and worshipping will give the same benefit as from Manikarnika of Varanasi. So all these mythologies mentioned in various texts try to prove the antiquity of Unnakoti Tirtha as an ancient pilgrimage site but they do not bear any authentic historical evidence. There are many fairs and festivals that happen there. One of them is Ashokashtami Mela, and uh, it is held in the month of April, uh, and as well as Posh Sankranti Mela. So it's an old photograph which I got, um, you know, but uh, still I'm trying to, uh, you know, go to the site during this time. But unfortunately, unfortunately due to COVID, couldn't go. But uh, it is said that thousands of pilgrims, pilgrims visit this site. Pilgrims come and take the ritual bath in the Unukoti Chara 
And uh, there is another tradition that because it is uh, very close to the Mongolian uh, range also, so the Indo-Mongolite people identified this water as one of the major force of nature and is worshipped as Tuima or Ganga. And that is probably the reason that Unnakoti Kund is considered as a sacred place of pilgrimage. These are some of the photos. You can see that uh, how the pilgrims comes and uh, you know they wrap themselves in uh, unstitched red cloth and they take the dip in the holy uh, you know stream. And here you can see a priest who is uh, having Indo-Mongolite features. So finally, in the conclusion, I would like to say that Unakoti, a shelf pilgrimage site, was popular since ancient times and uh, when they worship nature and their deity emerged from these natural five elements, that is the Panchatattva. And this is referred to as Subrai. As observed, there might be influence of the Devraj cult, which was very popular in uh, Cambodia region, but with the change in the concept that in Cambodia and in, in that area, it represented the king as God, but here it is representing Shiva, the prime deity in human form. The site has many mythological stories attached to it. And so Unnakoti Chara is considered uh, to give the benefit same as Manikarnika. And in the last, I would like to say that uh, Unnakoti has a beautiful amalgamation of tribal, Tibeto, Burmese features and the classical iconographic elements. The artist has not strictly adhered to tribal style, amalgamated it with the classical image and has done some experiments by adding new features to it. This must have been an attempt to bring the tribes close to worship of Shiva and other Brahminical deities by keeping the tribal features and also retaining to their religious traditions, rituals, and mythologies. Finally, as one could see that Agatala is very remote and access to the site is not very good. Therefore, still it is an unknown site for many. And this is one of the reasons that it is away from human vandalism. But since it is open and if it is not protected, then because of natural degradation, we may very soon lose the site that has already experienced earthquakes and much Thank has been lost. Thank you very much for uh, thank you very much for uh, completing your completing your so now I am going to request from Sir Michael so now I am going to request best 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 okay Michael is here hello 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 can you hear me Okay, I, I was hearing feedback, so it, it's my turn. <laughs> okay, so, so, so Michael D. Giovanni is a, a senior associate professor of anthropology at the Westchester University, and he's also associated to the Museum of Anthropology. Museum of Anthropology and Archaeology. He's already fellow in the city of Swansea in Madison, member of the nomination committee of American Anthropological Association. And also he's a editor, co-editor and series editor of several journals related to uh, anthropological study of uh, tourism. He's my old good friend. We have walked um, some part of Banaras, mm -hmm. Muslim landscape. That's why he recommended my name to yeah. speak um, yes, Professor Singh, I'm Muslim sorry. Muslim landscape, being a Hindu, I was his landscape. <laughs> so that was his recommendation and that was uh, again published in Asgard series. So thank you, I have all that good memories and honor to my good friend Michael and then together with him, we have walked a little bit on the Santiago de Compostela. So that yes, was I was just going to mention that, we also did <laughs> Santiago. <laughs> so that was his inspiration and support. So with all that uh, old good in, intimate memories of co pilgrims, now I'm requesting my friend Michael to present his uh, paper and his uh, perspectives. 
Can right. Like him? Most of them. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Singh, for, Rana, for, for inviting me. Thank you for, for being here. Um, you know, I am a, I originally started out as a scholar. Uh, I was a tour operator uh, before going to do my PhD. And um, then I uh, worked originally studying UNESCO and tourism, world heritage and tourism in Cambodia and Vietnam. So I really enjoyed the, 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 the previous uh, presentation. Um, but in more recent times, uh, I've been working more so in, uh, in Italy, uh, studying pilgrimage uh, there at actually my, my family's uh, hometown area. Um, so I think, you know, what I, what I was going to do here uh, is kind of talk. I don't have a PowerPoint. Um, this was, I, you know, I want to apologize that I feel... <laughs> Uh, a little underprepared for this um, <clears throat> because things have been so so busy, uh, you know, in my life and in, in career going virtual. Um, and I feel like there's less time in, in during this pandemic uh, to do things. So I wanted to talk a little bit about kind of the, the, what I've been seeing, trends that I've been seeing in spiritual and wellness tourism and pilgrimage um, and kind of putting this in the back of our minds, because at least from some of the things I've been reading, uh, you know, the, the at, not abstracts, but the, the titles of the presentations and everything. I'm wondering how much we're taking into consideration changes, right, in 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 patterns or or predicting changes in patterns uh, because of these global uh, pandemics and, and these, these kind of new paradigm, or is it a new paradigm? Um, you know. So again, I wanted to apologize for for this not being maybe as uh, put together as I usually do. I usually write out a nice speech and PowerPoint. Um, and I do feel like there's less time in the pandemic to do things. And, and I wanted to focus on time for a second, of course, very important concept when we're talking about spirituality, um, the lack of mobility, right? Of shifts from work to home and back again, blurs uh, responsibilities and creates a sense of malaise, creates a sense of timelessness uh, when we were, when oftentimes we're trying to uh, mark out our calendrical time. Uh, this I think is one of the fundamental motivations for tourism. Right, a lot of these early scholars, especially the anthropology of tourism, like Nelson Grayburn and others, talk about tourism as a change and, and pilgrimage as a change in the everyday workaday life. Right, it's a right of intensification, as we would call it, or periodic seasonal rights that are meant to renew and refresh the social order, especially after times when we start to feel disconnected with each other. We need tourism and pilgrimage. I totally agree because it helps reconnect us to our roots to recenter us after periods of you know, feeling alienation and um, not being uh, connected to other people. It helps shift our minds and our eyes. Indeed, you know, we just heard, of course, from an art historian where we were shifting you know, our, our eyes uh, to different uh, aesthetic features and different sculptural features and different myths that were being, or story, you know, uh, ideas that are being called out about the divine. So, Pilgrimage and tourism are both predicated on what I've called, uh, what we call alterity or otherness, right? We travel often long distances to engage. David Picard and I have argued uh, in, in, in the other books, I guess I could pull it out to show you, but in other books, there are two major forms of otherness, right? That are objects of travelers' mobilities. One is the perceived other, that is, peoples and cultures and landscapes and architectures and art and destinations that are seen to be different or unique or unusual, right? So that's one. And oftentimes are very much predicated on kind of Western colonial ideas of being the, the colonial other, right? And, what, and then what we also call as a second form, the other inside us, the other in us. That is a way to play out our own alternative identities, to see our own selves in a different light. In our book, Tourism and the Power of Otherness, we talk about the other in, in us as both alternative uh, social identities, such as playing out these colonial era fantasies of being explorers. And, you know, I did a lot of work in Vietnam and I worked as a tour operator in Vietnam and Cambodia and like all the hotels for Westerners are always these very colonial, and India too, these very colonial era kinds of architecture to help the, the Western tourists satisfy kind of those fantasies of, of pretending they're back a hundred years and, and being the, the people in power and, and, and as colonists, right? But, but there's also uh, the other in us could be some other component of ourselves that lie deep and hidden, but need to be released. 
such as those who travel to engage in shamanic events like ayahuasca tourism and, and, and even yoga and meditation as, we, as, as Rana talked about. So spiritual tourism and pilgrimage uh, I've defined as, uh, as a, a hyper meaningful journey. So they're kind of, it's similar to tourism, but it has this added quality of being hyper meaningful or extra meaningful for the traveler themselves. This is a very postmodern kind of idea of what pilgrimage is that you have to really talk to the person themselves. And one traveler could see themselves as simply a tourist or a visitor or a local, but other ones would see themselves as a pilgrim, right? That there's something really extra meaningful here, right? They hyper meaningful journeys work on both of these other in us senses very much simultaneously, right? Pilgrimage destinations across time and space often take the shape of unique landforms, right? The other, the, 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 the more uh, visible other, such as mountains like Mount Kailasha, Mount Meru, right? Or canyons and lakes in Southeast Asia. We, you know, we have these wonderful sacred banyan trees uh, and these indentations of the earth that are believed to be the Buddha's footprints. You know, these are seen as axis mundi, right? These are seen as the, pro the, the sacred center of the earth, right? That is held in just juxtaposition to the profane or secular centers of daily social life. And by going there, you are kind of performing very bodily and visually and, 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 um, and, and performatively um, this kind of engaging with otherness of getting out of your workaday social life and getting more centered uh, into your spiritual center, right? Humans as Eliade, the great uh, historian of religion says, also strive to replicate these axes mundi in architecture and art, constructing often these awe-inspiring temples and shrines that are themselves out of the ordinary profane world. From the soaring cathedrals of Christianity to the wonderfully intricate Jain temples to the simple Torii and rope tie trees of, of Shintoism. Right? These two are objects of spiritual devotion. And as spirituality has transformed over time and across cultures, they've been reinscribed with different meanings. Right? So that's another kind of form that we're talking about here. Do we look at, for example, the, the sites that we were just hearing about as a spiritual sacred center where these um, the, the images of the gods and goddesses have uh, sacred power, right? That can be often transferred to us. Or are they, do they have more heritage value? It's still hyper meaningful, right? They're still valorized, but they have different meanings uh, and, and different qualities based on the cultures uh, and, and worldviews of the peoples that are visiting. But why do we travel these sacred sites? Is it just simply to change our pace and refresh ourselves? as many tourism scholars would argue. I would submit that for these travels to be hyper meaningful, to be considered pilgrimage, there needs to be the attempted fulfillment of deep personal well-being. right? We travel to these axes mundi with an understanding that we're there to commune with the ultimate other, the spiritual rather uh, like sacred, the, the supernatural rather, the, the spiritual rather than the secular, the supernatural rather than the mere natural, right? Now, different cultures have different worldviews, and I don't want to sound Euro or Christian centric in my comparison of the two, because, you know, there is a, in, 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 you know, in Christianity, in the Abrahamic religions, there's a dichotomy, right, between supernatural and natural that really doesn't exist uh, in, for example, in South Asia. But what I'm trying to say is that in spiritual tourism pilgrimage, there's often a distinctive regard for working on and getting in touch with the other in us, the other that often transform, that transcends this social world. Right? So in the Abrahamic tradition of Christianity and Islam and Judaism, this is usually conceptualized as kind of some sort of a soul or the divine um, or a saint or something like that. Maybe an Atman, if I want to use more of a South Asian reference. But it can also be simply the element of us that aligns more with the natural world, the universe, the Brahman, you know, or something like that. Again, uh, to use this term a little out of context. Um, so in short, it's undertaken to achieve holistic well-being. And you know, for well-being, we talk about this being the synergy of biological, psychological, emotional, social, and spiritual health. As and this is a definition from the World Health Organization. So perhaps nothing seems to have been disrupt disrupting this so much as the current COVID nineteen pandemic. I say this not out of some frenzied awe that seems to have overtaken many of us. At least you know uh, these tourism scholars uh, at the during the mass quarantines and the shutdowns that rocked the globe in early spring. I think one of the really interesting things that occurred 
And I, I don't know actually where, because this is certainly wasn't the case for me, but all of a sudden everybody had all this free time to bang out these articles about how COVID how is changing tourism and everything else all around the world. People are writing the, I don't know. I was, I was stuck homeschooling my children, uh, teaching classes that I have to put online, doing all these other things. But anyway, a lot of people were very productive in that time period. And some of these very early uh, papers really did talk in, in these, these terms of being awed about what is going on, which is totally uh, valid. You know, the, for me as a, as a Catholic, the quarantines happened around uh, Easter time, you know, a big holiday for us. You had the Pope come out and do uh, public, uh, very unusual public uh, venerations of, of, of these saints icons to pray to God to end the pandemic. I mean, these are things that still move me thinking about the images that we saw on television, you know, and I would sit there with my kids and my wife watching and praying on television, which is such a weird way of doing things, which we're still doing there. We still see the masses live stream. For example, we don't go to church. I, I do, but my kids don't. So, but anyway, I say this, right? That nothing seems to have disrupted uh, all this conception of tourism and well-being as much as the COVID-19 pandemic. But I say this because pandemics and COVID-19 in particular is disruptive to our well-being as a whole, as we know. It attacks our physical, you know, first it attacks our physical and biological well-being. Yet the quarantines intended to stop or stave off that physical attacks have created deep senses of isolation, depression, and stress as we work and homeschool, right, from home, as our usual routines are disrupted, as we're cut off from our social circles and avenues of sociality that we utilize for these small everyday periodic changes in pace that we needed. You know, one of the things I couldn't get into my office until uh, the school year started. So for the whole spring semester, I was at home and this really, uh, it makes me feel so much better to at least be able to do this, to travel at 4.30 in the morning to my office just so that I can <laughs> be somewhere else, right? Um, this, this helps. But second, and this is something that we want to discuss, especially as geographers, COVID-19 is intimately tied to tourism and global mobility. It's, it likely emerged at a time of festivity and conviviality as locals and what we would maybe call domestic tourists in China were busy preparing for New Year's holidays. And then it snowballed into a pandemic through the same tools and infrastructures that tourism utilizes, global travel, airplanes, public transportation, and so on. Although new research is revealing that COVID-19 had been in Europe and also in the United States much earlier than reported or identified. And they're doing uh, tests, um, doing tests of the wastewater uh, in Italy and Spain. And they, they found that it was there before Christmas. So it was already coming through, uh, but it wasn't being reported and it was at, at a low level. Um, basically the first documented cases in Italy, which is you know, where I uh, work and, and, and um, study, um, but also which bore some of the most significant brunt of the pandemic early on, um, the first documented cases were two Chinese tourists in Milan, followed by an Italian that was returning home from Wuhan. So, uh, and then one of the first documented cases in the Americas was an Italian tourist going to Cuba, right? So you see that tourism, tourists, these were some of the early vehicles. Uh, uh, tourism was the early vehicles, the means by which the outbreak snowballed into a pandemic. But third, of course, as we know, it has rather disproportionately affected the tourism and hospitality sectors. As airlines and travels were grounded, hotels and Airbnbs were shuttered and restaurants were closed even at the local level. In short, the vehicles of globalization were affected. Even when these measures weren't enacted, like stopping you know, the airlines and when people were still traveling around, we, we did already see evidence of de what some people, what some scholars were calling deglobalization, right? Borders were closed. This is some of the most uh, important you know, fundamental things. When have we seen massive, on a mass scale borders being closed to people? consulates and embassies were locked down and visas weren't processed. So even when borders weren't closed, people couldn't get visas to travel over. So they were effectively closed. Um, I do a lot of work and my next book that's coming out in a couple months is on study abroad. And we're seeing moratoriums on study abroad for the next couple of years, not just because we don't know, you know, there's uncertainty over um, whether things will be safe to travel, but because people aren't gonna be able to get visas in time. We can't process uh, the kinds of legally, the kinds of um, uh, mass um, um, global mobility and, and mobile education that we need to. And so people are trying to, to especially in my university, trying to embrace more um, online kinds of, of study abroad, right? You're not really going abroad, but you're virtually zooming into to, to Italy or to India or something. 
So today there are laws regulating who can come into what countries, what nationality being a key consideration, another thing. Uh, as, an, as an American, as we know, America's not in the best of situations right now. Um, and many countries are closed to us, including Europe. Um, but of course, I'm also a dual Italian citizen, so I'm allowed to go to Italy if I wanted to, uh, but a, as an Italian, but not as an American, for example. So you have these other kinds of very interesting political uh, considerations here. So I've been closely following the developments at my field sites in Europe and in Southeast Asia, particularly in how it's affected spiritual tourism and pilgrimage and also study abroad. Another form of global mobility that takes on these features of both tourism and anti-tourism, right? Study abroad also is seen as a hyper meaningful and often hyper engaged or overly engaged educational journey. So, and I've also been closely monitoring the academic output concerning tourism in the form of both peer reviewed publications and online discussions in such forums as Trinet. So I don't know if any of you are on uh, Trinet, but you can get very contentious arguments uh, among tourism scholars because they come from industry, they come from academia, they come from, uh, you know, tourism as a study is dominated a lot by business and hospitality uh, and marketing uh, people uh, who have a very different idea than, let's say, anthropologists and social scientists who are looking at more of the social impacts and are, you know, tend to be a little bit more, let's say, leftist in, in orientation, in, you know, talking about climate change and, and race and things like that. So um, in these, uh, in all these kinds of talks and writings and publications, the topic of the effects of COVID-19 take on a very predictive quality here. When will things go back to normal? How will they go back to normal? Can they go back to normal? While responses today are understandably more nuanced than initially, we still see these responses to the questions aligning around these kind of these two binaries or poles. On the one hand, we, um, we kind of see what, I would, what I've called in, the, in my study abroad book that's coming out this business as usual predictions. And on the other hand, we see more transform transformation minded uh, projections, right? So when they're thinking about how is tourism gonna change or will it change, you have these really these, these two poles and, they, and, they, and they're, they're, very, um, they're, they're very different. There's, there's very little people who are publishing on the midpoint between these two, probably because it's not as polemic, it's not as interesting. But uh, which is what I would say. I'm kind of in the middle, <laughs> but uh, and I haven't published on it. Um, but you know, on the one hand, you see, you know, mostly the business and marketing people kind of giving these kinds of predictions for when it will go back to normal and how we have to tweak right these processes to to make things go back to normal. On the other hand, you have these many more people who are looking at sustainability, right, and saying that well, we need to. This is a great time to pause and to transform tourism, right. So the business as usual projections typically argue that we will and should fundamentally return to some sort of normalcy. This will be a new normal to be sure, but the basic processes and ideals of tourism and tourism infrastructures will you know, remain. Thus those, so if we're looking, you know, what I did when I was looking at this is I, I asked who, what, when, where, why, and how, you know, it was very basic. Who is, who is this for? What kind of tourism are we talking about? Where is the destination or, the, or is it gonna change? why should it change or why this projection and how should it change, right? So the who, what, and where in the business as usual projections seem to be somewhat static. We're still talking about kind of this, this idealized mass tourist kind of thing, uh, visiting the same types of destinations and patronizing the same types of businesses, the hospitality businesses. The how does seem to be slightly modified. And if we were to take, if I could do this on a, on a PowerPoint, if I had time, I would then kind of zoom in and see that there is a little bit of a spectrum in this, in this poll about the how. On, on one end, the far end of the spectrum, right? The case can be argued for more of like phased opening ups, right? This gradual, slow, linear process of opening up and employing things like the use of NPIs is what, is what they're calling it, or non-pharmacological interventions. Those are things such as mask wearing and social distancing, right? So we're not, gonna, we're not talking about taking shots of, of, of you know, of, um, uh, you know, what is it called? Um, you know, like a, um, antiviral things, but really washing your hands and, and doing those things and enforcing social distancing. Whereas more centrists argue that to be viable, things do have to change. The destination should diversify. And a lot of this is about branding, which I think is, I'm sorry if any of you guys are destination branders, but which seems a little bit superficial, right? You're not really changing anything. You're just trying to branch out and say, hey, look what we have to get other, to capture other kinds of audiences. 
and they should integrate more AI, virtual reality, and virtual tourism to capture those who aren't comfortable actually visiting yet, but who are searching the internet for new destinations. A lot of this is a talk of degrowth, okay, or limiting the number of travelers in a destination, such as what Saudi Arabia did at Mecca this year, right? You had, you had very um, enforced limits or quotas, and those could be direct like Mecca, right? The only a certain amount of people could come this year are allowed in given visas, or they could be indirect, such as increasing the prices for travelers or utilizing means that are only open to certain types of travelers. So we saw that, you know, two places that come to mind here. The first that, that has been going on a little bit longer than the, the pandemic was Rwanda. So if you go to Virunga in, in, uh, on the border of Congo, Rwanda, and Uganda, where the gorillas are, um, it's very expensive to, to spend an hour with the gorillas. But at the time when I took uh, students there a couple of years ago, it was $500 a person, which is a, which is a lot of money. Now it's up to $1,500 a person, right? The, and they stated very clearly, we need to keep the numbers down and we want to limit it to people that we kind of think are gonna be better tourists, right? The richer people, the more well-traveled people, the people who are willing to spend that much money. Of course, what happens is most people are then going around to Congo or Uganda, visiting the same mountaintop and paying much less money for it, right? Um, but also we see this in some of the ideas that Cambodia had early on, as I'm sure some of you guys uh, were aware that Cambodia was uh, considering and debating, I can't remember if, if it actually is happening or not, but, but charging travelers 15, I think it's $1,500 uh, to come into the, into the, the country um, to cover costs of quarantining before, when you get there and to cover any anticipated costs that if you had, if you were tested, and you do seem to be positive for COVID or the COVID um, uh, virus or antibodies that you would have to then go to the hospitals and things like that. And that money covers that. Again, you know, I particularly find this trend uh, could be the trend for the short and longer term, although I'm a little bit troubled by it, as you could probably tell, it seems that these kinds of direct and indirect quotas would inevitably self-select certain more privileged groups over others thereby exacerbating some of the social inequalities between more elite mobile hosts, uh, mobile guests, and the less powerful uh, immobile uh, hosts that are, that are on site. Um, and, you know, I should say that as the, the head of the, um, the Anthropology of Tourism Interest Group for, for several years, I had the um, uh, honor of, of addressing ECOMOS, which I'm also a member of uh, the, the advisory body of UNESCO, um, when we were talking, I think in 2017, about sustainable tourism. And um, I did a sweeping, um, we, were, we were redoing an ECOMOS, we were redoing our uh, charter uh, to, to integrate more sustainable tourism into sustainability into uh, heritage preservation and tourism. And um, I was asked to do the anthropological perspective. And so I, I did this big sweeping survey with uh, the members of, of my organization and with the comparable organization and another anthropological group. And really, uh, we were very much focused, I found, uh, on the social inequality issue uh, in sustainability, right? So there were obviously, we were talking about environmental sustainability and how it's tourism, massive tourism and airline travel and things are very bad for the environment. But as social scientists, as anthropologists, we really focused on these social inequalities um, and structural inequalities that seem to uh, occur there. And so I do fear that with these kinds of phased openings in the business as usual model, we get a little bit into um, broadening inequalities instead of stopping them. But the why is really what's interesting here. So when questioned, uh, we're attacked as a case may be in Trinet. And if you're on this Trinet, you do, you just recently, you there were, there were these arguments between two very vocal uh, members, one who is much more of this business as usual person. And I know, cause he also peer reviewed a, a, a book of mine once. Uh, and, and then one uh, who was, who's a very, very liberal um, uh, activist uh, who really is always talking about trying to transform tourism, right? So the two separate poles and they're kind of attacking each other sometimes, right? So, but when questioned the people who are on that spectrum of business as usual, really make these predictions justify themselves in means of economics, right? They say, look at all the jobs and livelihoods lost. Italy was projected 85% to 90% of, of jobs in the tourism sector were lost, right? Uh, so, and I think it's something like 35, 40% of the GDP uh, of, of the country um, is in tourism. And so you see this big down economic downturn 
right? So, uh, and, and, and then in my own talks uh, with people at, at these pilgrimage sites, they talk about feeling very real social isolation. Locals are talking about that, you know, as much as they complained about the fact that they were being over tourists or there are too many tourists, um, now they're not there. They feel isolated. They feel, uh, you know, uh, they, they, they feel lonely, right? So these, these people have been accused, uh, not the locals, but the, the, the business as usual people have been accused of boosterism, uh, which is this blind promotion of a cause, you know, business as usual at all costs, because we're, you know, neoliberal and thinking in terms of business. <clears throat> I don't really think this is fair, as they justify predictions made by making recourse to historical trends. So tourism continues to grow in the last century, despite other epidemics like SARS and avian flu. And I know I was a tour operator during that period in the early 2000s in Vietnam and Cambodia. We all traveled there without any even worry. You know, I mean, granted, I was also in my 20s, so I didn't care. Um, but my elderly travelers really didn't. They went to Vietnam. They didn't eat, they didn't eat chicken when we were there. And that was like basically it, right? There also terrorism, ISIS, wars that were going on. Tourism still grew. Right. And in fact, there were more tourists traveling over one billion by 2012 uh, than there were uh, people deployed in warfare across the world. And this is a very belligerent time period as well. Um, and, you know, I just published an article with Iranian scholars. So I know we had uh, we just had uh, a paper that I zoomed in on. Uh, on, on, from, from an Iranian scholar. So on the Karbala pilgrimage, right? The pilgrimage from Iran into Iraq uh, during uh, ISIS, right? And that's possibly one of the best examples is one of the largest pilgrimages uh, in the world uh, and, um, for Shia. And, uh, and, and yet spiritual travelers, despite the fact that ISIS has threatened, has threatened to uh, harm them, uh, and everything else, they continue to go in mass, right, to visit these hyper meaningful sites. So we do see a form of resilience. And I bet I didn't, I wasn't able to zoom in for maybe Kieran or Daniel Olson's uh, talks uh, yesterday. But I would imagine because we're, we're friends, and I've, I've been on panels with them before, that they're probably they probably pointed this out that if any kind of tourism is resilient, pilgrimage seems to be a little bit more resilient than other ones, because people will travel for other reasons. And the, the bodily harm, the, the bodily care aspect is, is less important as, as maybe miraculous interventions and, and things like that. Um, so I don't know if that's what they said, but, but certainly that is, that is a consideration. So I know I'm probably, how much time do I have? Have I gone over already in my babbling here? <laughs> <laughs> no, you have completed your time, but kindly uh, complete in two, three minutes. Okay, I'll just do a two or three minutes. So on the other side of the spectrum, okay, those, there are those who see this period as a time of pause and reset, espouse a very different why, right? They, they ask, why should we pause? Not that because we feel bad, you know, like the, 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 on one side, they were talking about why will we need to help the people who have lost their jobs. And 90% of all these people who lost their jobs, we need to care for them. And I think that that's a very fine uh, reason why. Right. The, the, on the other side of the spectrum, the transformation people uh, really kind of view the, a, a different why, why this needs to be transformed. They view the current mass tourism and pilgrimage as fundamentally unsustainable. That is, it creates environmental, economic and sociocultural ills. Those are the kind of the three pillars of sustainability or economics, environment and uh, sociocultural sustainability. And so therefore, tourism should be reconceptualized. Right. Um, they also talk about degrowth. Uh, you know, um, but, but instead of saying degrowth is a problem, right, uh, they say uh, that degrowth is good, right? It helps carrying capacity, this, this term uh, that uh, Malthusians use, these, these terms that people use when they, they, they consider how, how many people uh, can be in a site and use resources before those resources get depleted, right? And we have this great, um, this, this weird thing called the uh, Earth Offshoot Calculator, I don't know if anybody has gone on earthoffshoot.org, I mean, as, as geographers, uh, where they basically calculate if everybody lived like Americans, essentially, right? Uh, when will the earth be depleted of its resources? Uh, you know, when in the calendar year would the earth blow up, basically, and be depleted of resources and we die off? And what's really interesting is that the trends since 2000, I asked one of my students the other day to, to look up the earth offshoot since, since 2010, the last 10 years. And we've seen the date uh, gradually, um, pull out. So from, from 
from it was uh, I think 10 years ago it was August 28th right we would all, the end of the world would happen if everybody lived like me right and gradually up until last year it was July 28th so it's moved a whole month we have less time on this earth a, a, a less month on this earth because of how many more people are traveling, how much more airline travel, which has a significant carbon footprint and, and so on and so forth. What's interesting is this year, Earth Offshoot Day popped back to the 2010 trend. It's like we went back in time, you know, because everybody stopped traveling, right? So they, there is some, you know, basis for this kind of very much a utopian thinking that, hey, this is great. You know, if we can, if we can embrace this, right? It should be good uh, environmentally. Um, but also it could be good economically and socially because the time of pause can really be a time to start to rethink and reintegrate locals into um, heritage making, pilgrimage making uh, practices. So what I mean by that is in two ways. The first is that um, indigenous peoples usually are marginalized uh, when um, deciding on the practices at the destination, deciding on the meanings that these destinations have for them. So as we can see, a lot of people travel, let's say to Compostela or to Varanasi um, because of history and heritage, whereas locals might see these, these areas as being something different, have different meanings, right? Different sacred meanings. And if too many travel there and they, they are made to perform, let's say uh, for uh, travelers or, or something like that, um, they feel that they're, they're performing something that isn't uh, in line with what they believe. We see this, you know, my um, wonderful uh, anthropologist of, of um, tourism just passed away, Ed Brunner, and he wrote a lot of really important uh, pieces in the 90s and the 2000s about this, right? He, this very famous piece called The Maasai on the Lawn uh, uh, talks about how the Maasai people, you know, uh, basically perform uh, kind of primitive primitivity to Western travelers. But then when the Western travelers leave, they take off their, you know, they put their sneakers back on and go on their cell phones and they, they act like norm, you know, like more modern people again, you know, uh, and this could be a problem. But also we, we see the utopian ideas as being a time where we can try to integrate more indigenous run uh, travel as well. Um, this is quite utopian thinking. Right. And uh, while an anthropologist, you know, as a scholar of sustainability, I am hopeful. I don't see this as necessarily viable, but we did see trends uh, even in the ways that people were talking about. Look, the lions uh, in uh, Africa are now, you know, taking over. They're laying on the streets because there are no humans there. And there's fish in the, the canals of Venice and dolphins, which are, turned out to be not true. But there is this kind of utopian and hopeful thinking, you know, that was going on. Um, so I, you know, I, I'm sorry that I didn't get to really prepare this much, much more. And I know that I'm out of time, Let, I'll say just one word, which I, I don't have written down, um, about, uh, wellness, uh, tourism that I think that if there is one area, one how that could marry the two areas, I do think it is in wellness and spiritual travel because we have to understand that well-being is more than just economic well-being. Right, sustainability is more than just what is sustainable economically, the status quo, um, but rather what uh, what needs you know of all the kinds of tourism that occur, uh, trying to get a center, a spiritual center, a well-being, a psychological and emotional social center. Those are things that people really. Are as soon as my own field sites in, in in Italy opened up, we saw people traveling there you know, with masks and everything, because they wanted to be there. They would go to churches again, right? We saw uh, monks in Cambodia, because there were no foreign travelers, they were able, to, and locals were able to come to Angkor and actually use the site as it was, you know, we, we think it was intended to be used for. Um, we also saw um, a, a revisiting of the local. Uh, and I think that's really important that we do see well, wellness travel, even in our own hometowns. We were, you know, I got to know my neighbors uh, more than I ever did because we would take small trips around, uh, around town for our well-being to, to keep, you know, sane, to keep, and to keep biologically healthy by walking around instead of sitting in our butts and my kids playing Xbox, you know, or something all the time. Um, and, and what that did was it created a new sense of social, uh, centeredness. It created a new sense of, of well-being. And of course it was tourism because it was, 
we were seeing the same sites that we would drive by or walk by every day, but in a new light, in a new appreciation. And that's really what tourism and pilgrimage is about. So I'm sorry that I, I went over. I don't, I can talk more about this, of course, but, um, but those are some of the thoughts. I wanted to kind of put in all these different trends. I hope it was good enough uh, for you guys uh, today. <laughs> yeah, sure, it was nice. Thank you, thank you very much. Sure. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michael, for uh, trying to link all these perspectives. Where we are, how to be there, why we are there, and then, uh, uh, then in a single uh, phrase, if we... What is going on? Oh, you know, Rana, I just noticed, I, I, I didn't even plan this, but this is uh, from Santiago, I think when we... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that shell. <laughs> you realize yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. So in a single phase, if we can follow Indian metaphysics, we can say what Michael tried to do. So making a bridge, what we call from realization to revelation through spiritual tourism. So metaphorically, we can say like this, this is the way he had tried to explain his own journey. He started as a tour guide, moving in here and there. That's why we met. So I was guiding him and he guided me. So that was a good exchange of the whole idea. So thank you very much. And I hope you will elaborate all these things critically and more humanistically in your paper, which we are going to process. And I hope you will help us for that. So thank you very much again, Michael, with all the old memories and going to be in touch like this. Okay, I take this opportunity here. One paper which was planned, but not uh, presented and not scheduled also. And that was based on the experiences of uh, Shikoku pilgrimage journey, what called NLO. So I have experienced in 2011, I have performed half the journey with a priest and professor, professor of Indian philosophy and ethics. And he speaks Hindi and Sanskrit also. He has translated many Sanskrit texts in Japanese. My old friend, and in a way, my junior in Banaras in the university, I was his mentor. So he was here, but he has again gone some involvement. He's a very shy type of person. So I can't he speak like Michael. Never ending, oh, going on, oh, much, so much things, okay. And Hashimoto will just say, just say that, uh, okay, namaste, like this. So the simple thing was that one experiences of his spirit of place in Shikoku, Pilgrimage Henry, what we have experienced and what we have tried to co-share with that. We have already published that report in a Japanese uh, popular magazine type of thing. Now we have worked, in fact, Hashimoto is working on that and elaborating. So that I am not going to present just to inform it so that it can be added in the proceeding with the permission of all of you. So I am not going to present to you just for information. Those who are interested, I will send the earlier report to all of you and uh, you can read it and then support me what to be done for them. So thank you very much. This way, this session is going to be closed and now uh, I am uh, handling this to the main controller, Pravin Rana. Hello, Hello yes, yes. Uh, Hello, Hello. yes, yes, I'm there, I'm there. Oh, oh. So, so. Okay, so now he will handle about uh, this program. Yeah. Okay, please, okay, Praveen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, first, I'd like to say a few uh, words for Michael. Uh, of course, you know, since morning, I am pushing you through emails and then whether you are wake up or not. And then uh, it was, uh, I was not feeling well to not to see you in the list. And uh, that's why I was worried, oh my God, because one of our speaker from China, he was not able to enter in our seminar. So I thought what happened, at least Michael should see in the list. So thankfully, uh, you did a wonderful job for two days, you were traveling and then somehow you have managed. Uh, for me, uh, as a student of tourism, it was so nice to hear directly and then learning the experiences of your anthropology, sociology and tourism aspect, especially uh, whenever we are talking about post-COVID and during COVID, mostly our talks on tourism are focusing on economic. 
but most of the things which we are missing on, on social and socio-cultural aspect, starting from whether it is a social inequality or social isolation, that is a very two important factor which you have highlighted, which has given me thought that of course, a, a country like India or a city like Varanasi, where so many people uh, are dependent on tourism, not only on economic aspect, but socio-cultural meeting and other things. So that was wonderful to listen. But uh, uh, you are asking about several excuses of not giving presentations. The only excuse is uh, soon we are going to send you a request for a proper formal one hour, one hour at least lecture for the benefit of student, not for anyone. Whenever, whenever you will feel uh, fine free, we'll try to contact because we love to hear from you. Uh, so I'd like to again take opportunity that uh, we reach to the almost end of the session four where we, all the speakers have shared their views. It was a wonderful session. Now we came to the end of session, what we say validatory session. And we have our guest uh, of validatory session. We have two guests. One is Professor Sandeep Pulsesha, sir. And one, uh, my team member, Professor Prashant Gautam, sir. So Sandeep, Professor Sandeep Kulsheshta, sir, is going to say some talks on the validatory session end of the program. And he is a senior vice president of Indian Tourism and Hospitality Congress and former director of Indian Tour Travel and Tourism Management Institute. He has been and he is in a several governmental committees of tourism development in India and visited all over the world and represented India on a several platform. So uh, we have started with a tourism and hospitality and finally we have came to the end with the Indian Tourism and Hospitality Congress. So what a wonderful combination of that. So I'd like to invite Professor Sandeep Kulsesha sir to address his uh, uh, talk on the validatory session as a guest speaker. Professor Kulsesha sir, kindly unmute your mic please. Good evening to all of my Indian friends, Professor Rana, P.B. Singh sir, uh, friends from uh, Europe and US, good noon to you all and the fellow friends from Japan, let me tell you, late good evening. Indeed, it's a matter of pleasure in, to discuss an uh, aspect this is related with the Indian tourism and uh, the topic for my discussion is on journey of tourism and hospitality through Indian epics and scriptures. Dear friends, when we talk about uh, India, uh, I'm not saying just because of some emotion. Generally, it so happen when you discuss about spirituality, certain things come from the heart or from the emotions. Whereas whatever I am discussing to you, you have the Google with you so you can search it out. In today's scenario, we, we just talk about the different civilizations. But when we talk about the Indian civilization, the history of Indian civilization, till last two years, it was up to the Mohan Jodhra and Harappa because the excavations have shown it. But recently, uh, there is a province called Haryana in India. The excavation has shown that this civilization is far behind than 3,500 years more than 35 means it was around 5,000 plus years old. Dear friends, uh, when we talk about tourism or when we talk about the travel, of course, to travel and tourism, both are closely interrelated. And once you are getting some happiness, leisure and pleasure that become a tourism. Michael has rightly said, and being a guide, you know things better that when we, when we talk about the travel and tourism, they are closely interrelated. And of course, happiness is the crux of their business. And when we refer to India, you will perhaps find India is the only country where we have that liter literature is available in the form of Vedas or Upanishad or so-called other uh, historical uh, books related to the religion and spirituality. Dear friends, in other countries we have discussed that a person used to go from one place to another place in the same nation or from one country to another country. Whereas India, you will find that people used to travel from one planet to another planet. 
and there are several stories written stories there is a story called king kukudmi who went up to brahma lok another planet for the marriage of his daughter and finally he returned back because of the uh, time gap and then he got married with his uh, daughter with uh, uh, lord krishna's younger uh, elder brother uh, and uh, the daughter's name was revati i think um, uh, rana pb singh sahab may be aware about this dear friends when we talk about indian tourism there are certain things those are very interesting and very important uh, you know there is a saying that god's guest is considered as the god and when you just refer the tetriya upanishad there you will find that atithi devo bhava concept is there and you know uh, indian lives were full of you know joy recreation and entertainment and that's why they used to go for the arcade arcade is called hunting and they used to go to van vihara van vihara is called the forest site visit i say nauka vihar nauka vihar uh, uh, boating or cruising or tirthatan that is called pilgrimage in india tourism when you refer the history of tourism it is start from uh, you know um, the word is called tirthatan or the pilgrimage so religious tourism and vfr vfr is stand for visiting friends and relatives the moment you turn down the history of uh, tourism you just land to the 18th century and 17th century where you realize that oh the history book says the tourism book says the literature says that it was during 18th century when you know thomas cook and cox and king they came into the existence in india this tourism was prevailing since years together dear friends when we talk about the tourism uh tourism and hospitality also uh, were closely related uh, and you know as per the indian epics it is clearly written when atithi the person who does not have the exact date and it, there was some certain reason also the reason was that you know the mode of transportation was not perfect that you can reach to a particular date or particular time so atithi means who does not have the fixed date to come and therefore uh uh you know uh they are being called a person who is coming without prefix itinerary and when we talk about the code of conduct for the hospitality for the person who is coming because atithi devo bhava means the guest is considered to be the god so there are five things those are written in sanskrit they call dhupa dhupa means the fragrance while the guests are coming you give the fragrance to the tourist or to the to the to the atithi or to the guest and second one is the deep deep stand for you know uh, uh lightning of lamp so when the guests are coming into the uh, to the you know reception area or other places we have to enlighten we we have to light the lamp to welcome him and there is another term called naivedya naivedya that is in english we i am talking about the sanskrit which is one of the oldest scripts of the world sanskrit language and it has been accepted by un also so when we talk about the naivedya naivedya means edibles so when the guest is coming you just offer some edible or certain fruits to them and then there is a saying that when you are just welcoming the guest use the akshat akshat is meant for the rice you know so the rice you can uh, put to the forehead of the person and this is a symbol of the well being of the person and then the last one is the pushp pushp is called the flower so as per the as per the you know uh, indian scriptures you will find all these are given there dear friends my fellow friend have discussed about the sustainability people used to discuss about the un resolution which was released just how a few years back only but when we just refer our indian scripts or the epics we realize that it is clearly written there we believe in you know shanti mantra says that atithi it says you know uh, welfare of everyone and we call that uh, 
ಪೃಥ್ವಿ ಶಾಂತಿ ರಾಪ ಶಾಂತಿ ಅಂತರಿಕ್ಷ ಶಾಂತಿ ಯು ನೋ ಆಲ್ ದಿ ಸರ್ವೇ ಭವಂತು ಸುಖಿನ ವಿ ಬಿಲೀವ್ ಆನ್ ದ ವೆಲ್ ಬೀಯಿಂಗ್ ಆಫ್ ಎವ್ರಿ ಒನ್ ಅಂಡ್ ವೆನ್ ಯು ಜಸ್ಟ್ ರಿಫರ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇನ್ ಟು ದ ಟೂರಿಸಮ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ನಾಟ್ ಕನ್ಫೈನ್ಡ್ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಟು ದ ಟೂರಿಸ್ಟ್ ರಾಧರ್ ದ ನೇಚರ್ ರಾಧರ್ ದ ದ ಸ್ಕೈ ದ ಸೀ ಆರ್ ದ ವಾಟರ್ ಆರ್ ದ ಪ್ಲಾಂಟೇಷನ್ ವಿ 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 ಆರ್ ಕನ್ಸರ್ನ್ ವಿತ್ ದ ವೆಲ್ಫೇರ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಪೀಪಲ್ now where another important thing just if you refer the carrying capacity of the destination don't believe upon me there is a festival which is being celebrated in india called kumb and in the kumb uh, uh, fair kumb is the nasa also has give is verified it is the largest migration of the people on the earth largest migration of the people on the earth for the kumbh festival they celebrate after 12 years and you know in kumbh also the crowd management was so proper that on a particular date this monk this group of monk will take the bath you know so all these was the fix that was for the crowd management and when we talk about the responsible tourism concept in indian uh, epics it is clearly written you know uh, that we respect to the plants we have developed the relation with the with the animals cow is considered as the mother as per uh, sanatan tradition the cat is considered as our maternal aunt you know so this is how the indian monks and rishis they have developed the relationship between the animals and this is a wonderful you know uh, uh, relation which talk about the responsible tourism we have we have uh, uh, we have uh, developed the relation with the tree and plants also so there are n number of examples are available for uh, on this important aspect dear friends one thing which is very important in today's era during covid 19 period we if we just go through to the global scenario we realize that tourists are more keen to have peace they are more keen to have happiness and when we talk about the happiness that is the inner happiness even the countries like us and italy they have realized that oh just by developing the concrete jungle we cannot provide the happiness to the people the nature we have to come back to the nature and here the india play an important role of course the number of victims are coming every day in a high volume but dear friends if you just refer all these information and data in comparison to the overall population or when you refer the uh, refer the um, you know recovery rate of recovery you will find altogether different aspect so what i am trying to tell you when we talk about the, the 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 mental happiness you would realize that that's the reason then people from across the globe they are coming to india and they are not going to delhi or mumbai or calcutta rather they are they wishes to go to varanasi the narrow lane of varanasi they wishes to go to ayodhya they wishes to go to haridwar or rishikesh india is a rich center and i am sure that it will come back again so far as well beingness of tour, tourist are concerned as well as when we talk about the ayurveda what a pleasing surprise today we are talking today unwt is talking about the domestic tourism promotion of domestic tourism but in 2019 itself the honorable prime minister of the country mr modi uh, during his one of the program called man ki baat he has referred and he has requested all the citizen to visit at least seven places of tourist interest and share it through photographs with their photographs and experience post it so see this is the country which has a wonderful legacy and i'm sure uh, when we talk about today's present scenario where the the entire globe is suffering because of this covid-19 pandemic i'm sure india will provide a live example to the people across the globe and now people have started realizing that tourism is not going to the casino it is not confined to the las vegas it is not confined to the macau rather when we talk about the tourism tourism is something which has been created by bhutan and that is called happiness index 
part also. So once again, I extend my sincere thanks to the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Starting from mythology to Las Vegas was a continuous journey of tourism and Tirthatan and Deshatan. Thank you for wonderful views. Now I'll uh, invite, uh, not as a guest, but as a part of organizing committee member, Professor Prashan Gautam, who is also organizing uh, secretary of this event, as well as very good friend of mine since last 20 years. He's a professor of tourism in University Institute of Hospitality and Tourism Management and former director of the same institute, as well as his research area in tourism planning and sustainable development. So may I request uh, my friend, Professor G Prashan Gautam, for his views on this webinar. Uh, thank you, Dr. Praveen. Uh, first of all, uh, respected uh, Rana sir, respected Sandeep sir, and uh, all the respected uh, speakers. It was really a treat to listen to all. And uh, I'm just presenting my views on behalf of uh, uh, maybe the organizing committee or as a, uh, as a participant, I can say. One thing, like it was really like I was listening to Jyoti ma'am and uh, she was talking about the Unakoti uh, caves, you know, the cultural resources. I come, I, I for the last six six months, we are sitting in, in home and uh, maybe like spending a good time by reading or maybe exploring many things on internet. So I have experienced a few things that this impact of uh, uh, the coronavirus uh, outbreak on the tourism industry, it has impacted, hampered the mass tourism. The so-called this concept of skip the lines is going to die very uh, for, uh, for a few years, at least for the few years. And the prevailing tourism was mostly focuses around the mass tourism. Although this spiritual tourism has a connection with the mass tourism also. At this particular point of time, I, I, I'm not sure about in future, what will be the future of the mass tourism in, in, in very short future. Although the other, other major ingredients of the tourism, they included sun, sand, sea, culture, and uh, heritage, uh, mice, business, or events. And nature, generally nature of tourists, it was holidaying, participation, and business. But these, all these aspects, they are now being uh, seriously um, uh, hampered. A large number of people now working from home. And I have experienced that due to more people, they are spending time on social media. The people, they have started sharing more about their local cultural and heritage resources. The main title of this, uh, 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 this seminar, this conference, is on placemaking. And uh, place making is something like uh, re-establishing or uh, revisiting or enriching something. So I see this time, this time as an opportunity uh, which will act as a very good resource for the place making. Shortly, shortly, there shall be a serious explanation of cultural and heritage resources of the society. Because being in a society, I know about my cultural resources in a better way. And that's through the eyes of the locals. And I expect we are going to have a very authentic and very good explanation of the resources. Sometime on a, on a lighter note, I say that it's going to hamper, it's going to hamper, have a serious impact on so-called historians. As local people, they are going to write their history and a, a description of the cultural resources in their own way. Even in India, most of our heritage or cultural traditions, they are being understood, explained, and presented in front of us by some people who are not the native of this place. Mainly they, they belong to, they are the foreign authors. So I believe that in future, there will be even my friends, they are now coming up there on uh, social media or other forms of the media. I believe in future there will be a competition among our friends to share about the resources in their neighborhood. Although I can see my cliques, they have started challenging one another, even from the my tourism academia, they are challenging one another by sharing the photographs, uh, having some cultural resources or 
similar kind of resources and they are challenging hashtag they are, they are going ahead with the hashtag so these days and we have started also started witnessing fantastic video live sessions by various people even the caretaker of the monuments temples or historical places and and all enriching our cognitive domain so even even um, i can see a good number of like uh, youtube channels they are on the cards and what on what they are focusing they are focusing on their cultural and heritage or religious spiritual resources so this way a large amount of knowledge is being created by the society itself i believe i see an opportunity i see an opportunity for the knowledge management for the future knowledge man management so i can conclude in few two three lines that although the restoration work of the various uh, uh, maybe the heritage uh, these things uh, they will see some uh, financial cuts but since there will be no vast tourism so the life of the monument is going to be increased to i expect local people to rule the scene and now content entrepreneurship is is going to take a lead and we can see some serious involvement uh, and participation in destination management by the local people uh, in a true sense in the true sense and uh, very soon very soon we are going to see some fantastic community museums also and i see possibility of development of very authentic uh, hindi craft industry uh, industry also few years back uh, um, in a, uh, there's a state in india which is known as himachal they started a concept of kahani har gaon ki and they come up with a coffee table book and i believe i believe we have to be ready for similar kind of coffee table books from enthusiastic uh, local people so uh, i can say that uh, these these things they are going to be, uh, be uh, provide a very good resource for the place making of the destination and ultimately enriching the journey for the spiritual tourism this was my take thank you very much thank you so nice and uh, so creative and so in insightful view professor prashan uh, completely thinking differently how place making is going to help in knowledge creation rewriting history by the local sharing the uh, local stakeholders of course that are going to be major part in coming days in a morning session also we were discussing uh, in the session of uh, professor timothy when he was talking about not only very big or famous monuments are going to be important for society the local sites are also going to be important what we are talking about in the present world tourism day theme is also tourism and rural development so we are from coming from again rural to urban and urban to rural again uh, focusing on a local what government is also focusing we are also focusing so it was wonderful site in a very crisp manner thank you so much once again and uh, thank you for supporting the whole program uh, now i like to invite uh, professor rana pb singh sir ekla president to kindly give uh, a uh, word of thanks and conclude the session if uh, if any member has any other ob observation you can share otherwise we are going to end our session by by thanks giving uh, by professor rana pedi singh sir any other member like to add or should we conclude i think professor rana sir nobody uh, kindly conclude yeah. okay thank you very much uh, i think okay okay thank you very much so let me say a few lines just uh, giving in a nutshell that uh, uh 26 paper schedules so two papers dropped that one was something accidental problem with his father so they got admitted my good friend from vietnam ranjan on the part there and we were co-author of that and that was very close to what michael was talking more experiential and what to be done so that was more philosophical oriented paper but that was job and second was technical problem with my chinese friend chun uh, who i know since his bsc classes so okay i met him 11 years back and since then he's close to me 
but he tried his best and then here and there, even today he tried, but anyway. So two that dropped and two uh, papers not scheduled here because we thought there's no time, but that was in the abstract volume. So that has been later on added, one by Jyoti Rohila based on our observation, we have already listened. And another was which I have just given the title, uh, Professor Taijan Hashimoto from Toyo University, Tokyo, and uh, myself, what we did uh, in 2011, and later on he has added. So all together, and then three, four, you can say special presentation, one was inaugural address by Professor Bansal, and then from IGU Distinguished Inaugural Lecture by Professor R.V. Singh, Secretary General of the International Geographical Union. Then two recent presentation by Professor Sandeep Kurshastaji and uh, Professor Prashant Gautamji. So you can just add all together, then that became 30 in total number. So that is just to go give you overview of all that. So we have talked about philosophy, we have talked about experiences, we have also talked about so many intricacies, and then uh, the recommendation of what to be done, what is the impact of pandemic situation, what we have faced all together. So in a way you can say, this was just a one month preparation. And several times I have taken liberty of torturing my good friends. And the top in the list is Michael. That first time when I contacted said, oh, Ranaji, oh, you know that this is too short time. Oh, no, no. Then I said, look, listen one word. We are co-pilgrims. And it is your moral, ethical, and spiritual duty to help me. And then he said, okay, I will do. He never said any comment. He said, okay, I will do. Let me wait, 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 I will do. And then two, three emails, just wait one day more, one day, and then he put there. This is the way, and the same thing with Jalen and my co-author, and we are working together with Olson, like that. So, so many people, uh, uh, I tried to rush and they helped. So, a special gratitude and thanks to all of you. From my heart, from my mind, from my imagination, from all my senses, to all of you making this. The other thing is here. So this is the way, okay? Now the thing is technical point, one, two sentences I am going to tell you. That don't confuse with place making and place making, okay? Try to read from internet, etc. Place making, one word, is a very strong conceptual concept in architectural theory. That we are taking it. And that we are trying to set in the broad perspective of tourism and spiritual tourism, especially in pilgrimage. That is my bias, you can say. I am a co pilgrim. Okay, always walking like this. So that you have to keep in mind. And the second thing is, we got uh, only two, three day, days ago, I got tentative some agreement, close to agreement, you can say, from Springer Nature International Publisher, Switzerland something in process. So the first thing they have written, that uh, here are the four points you have to follow. I don't know which one is the first one, but uh, what I remember, that paper should be completely focused, well written. You have to give a certificate, this has been properly edited English. It is not like, like my Indian English, my own Indian English. And always I torture my good friend, Michael, because He's my co-pilgrim, then it is his duty. He's my guy, we have to edit. So only three pages, he will edit four times. Okay, that is our good relationship. And that's how I receive so many inspiration and so many new words, how to link, how to make it better. He will never criticize me, but he put something inside like this two, three times, then the same three pages will be something like very deeper. Now no one can change even comma. But no one knows that all this credit goes to my good friend, Michael. Why I told this story? Not emotional, no. Most of my papers, those who publish abroad, at least three, four times edited. Sometimes very badly. I felt a little bit tortured, late night working. And once I wrote to one of my friends, that article was nine times revised. Never rejected, but nine times revised. It took six years, and then I wrote a letter, not to the editor, but the main person behind the whole series, that was environmental science series. 
that look now it the paper becomes so good that why to publish there i withdraw my paper and i can publish it so I mean, more a great masterpiece he wrote a line rana remember this i am also contributing the same my own paper was changed five times so it is no big deal you are just like my son so your paper is changed only six times and remember who are the other contributors in the volume it is nothing like that you have to think in that way please don't write a single word that you are thinking this okay wait that has been published and then i received a letter of appreciation now no more a great anthropologist dealing with environment and all michael richardson yet you are the first indian whose article is published in this series why i am telling this this is the spirit of understand so whenever i am sending some letter don't be thinking it, this is rana's view it is a view to have something very creative all should be focused all will be peer reviewed all will be critically appraised then only finalized i am only a suggestive body and i am not one already in ecla series we have three members so they will just screen out them give i will take help from michael because he knows all the things from just anthropological and guide guiding pilgrims how to do the checklist things and then he also knows something very high level spiritual nut and bolt how to put that at the right direction to have the real meaning there okay so some persons will have that this is just my humble thing the letter will be that here are the guidelines no way nothing like that i if the letter says 150 to 200 words don't try to put 500 words then those people i am recently working for 5 years terrible just simply return they say my good recipe you have no sense to follow then why should i follow you so please help that this volume may come like this and other thing you have to keep in mind no way one can say that all the papers will be accepted this is all based on the peer review it is nothing like bad thing you have to remember that you have to devote part. time will be given at least 7 6 to 7 8 9 months it depends after our agreement this is the first thing 